Okay, we're all set there. Okay, thanks, Catherine. So this is the uh, March 13th, 2024 meeting of the short-term rental special committee. Uh, for those watching on video, I don't know whether we look dark uh, here. There's an electrical problem at town hall, so there's no lights in the chambers. Um, so I don't know what that looks like, but that's... If it looks odd, that's the reason for that. Um, I believe that uh, I have seen public notices of this, so this complies with the Freedom of Information Act, this meeting. And with that, we can get started. So, uh, Catherine, I just said that I believe the, no the requisite notices went out for the Freedom of Information Act. Yes. That's correct. Thank you very much. So we are now going to uh, get started. The um, so first of all, thanks to everyone who has commented in writing or in our forums. There's a lot of interest in what we're doing. We know that because of all the written and oral comments, as well as the numbers of people who have viewed the forums on uh, the video live streams and the recorded uh, uh, on YouTube after that. Today is a working session. There won't be comments or interaction with the public, but I do want to remind everyone that whenever the committee is done with its work, star, uh, whenever the committee is done with its work and an ordinance is drafted, there will be public comment uh, period for an ordinance, and uh, to be clear, that there will be public hearings, um, or a public hearing, or public hearings, whatever is needed, uh, to uh, in, in connection with the ordinance itself. So that's down the road, um, but but that that will happen, uh, assuming that we draft an ordinance. Today, we want to do two things. Um, hear from the members of the committee on their initial views of what, if any, problems exist and the broad strokes of ideas of how to address that. During our public forums, some people ask for a statement of problems caused by STRs. <clears throat> that motivates us to do our work as this committee. And I replied that it was too early to do that. Uh, I cannot speak for the committee. People on the committee would have different views. And the, we wanted to hear the views of the public before stating what we think, <coughs> excuse me, about the problems that we're, that we are addressing. And it occurred to me that for some people who commented during these sessions, and uh, some of them I think were consultants, um, uh, <clears throat> they were approaching it as if this were a corporation, a company hiring a consultant to come in and work on a problem. I understand, uh, having worked in a large corporation myself, that when you hire someone to come in and work on something, uh, if the consultant comes in and says, what's the problem? And uh, the manager says it's X and one person on the team says it's Y and another person says it's Z, the consultant, I assume, would think that the company is poorly managed because uh, the company should speak with one voice at that point and should have a clear articulation of the problem before they um, hire someone. By contrast, this is a municipality. This is a public body. 
and we all have different views and um, eventually those views get um, congealed into uh, legislation or municipality and ordinance and there's a vote and it could be a split vote that becomes law. So it's a different process and uh, previously was not the time to uh, articulate problems because we haven't gone through that process to speak uh, as one voice. And as I said, even when we speak with one voice, it could be a voice with dissenting views. That's that's the way it works in a democracy and in, in, in a uh, government institution. So <clears throat> with that, it is now time to articulate our initial views. Um, these will evolve as we gather uh, data and discuss among ourselves and hear from uh, town officials about enforcement efforts and things of that nature. But um, I thought that in order for this committee to work, we all need to, uh, to hear where each other are, are coming from uh, as a as a party. So I'm going to start off this process because um, I think that uh, um, what any of us say uh, could be the subject of negative reaction among people in a uh, community who think we're not doing enough, um, people in a community who think they're doing too much, and therefore, since um, there could be, uh, or I'm quite sure it will be criticism along those lines, I thought I, should, as the member of the town council was elected, I should be the one to uh, start off that process and, and hopefully uh, take take the most heat in that regard. Um, as I said many times before, this committee is unusual in that it is got a workload. I've been on a number of committees, Sapoa Club. Uh, this committee has, well, I was on the ARC, that has a big workload too, but um, this, this committee has a, a tremendous workload. They've been absolutely phenomenal uh, to work with in terms of enthusiasm and willingness to dig in. So once again, I, I thank them for that, but to the extent that perhaps I can say things that will take some of the heat uh, put it on me, um, I'm happy to do that. So <clears throat> in articulating where I'm coming from, I want to basically address um, some of the themes that have emerged uh, among the uh, large number of uh, people who said it's, who say that we shouldn't do anything. And essentially, why are we here? And at the end, I will give a very general statement of sort of where I think we should go in terms of addressing uh, issues, but not, but not with a lot of specifics. That's what we're going to get, get to as, as we proceed. The first thing um, that a number of people have articulated is that we uh, don't have the authority or, or at least shouldn't exercise the authority to legislate on this issue for the reason that a lot of the people affected, obviously, if there were to be something like a cap, is uh, our, our short-term rental owners obviously some of whom live here because uh, two of them are sitting to my right and um, but, but many of whom don't. The ones who live here can vote here, but the ones who don't live here and there are many short-term rental owners who do not live here cannot vote in our elections. And therefore the uh, argument goes we don't have the authority to proceed. Um, I don't accept that argument. 
legally, um, and I'm always like to preface any time you use the word legal by saying that even um, though I am a lawyer licensed in Pennsylvania, I have never been a lawyer in South Carolina. So I'm not uh, saying any legal opinion here, <clears throat> but really just an observation of what any, anyone can see. Um, municipalities pass various ordinances with where you have a lot of people in the who live there who own property there who can't vote and yet municipalities do that all the time we have a chart of all the ones that have done it with respect to short-term rentals to my knowledge there's never been any court case uh, in South Carolina or any well uh, well, Maurice Isaac said something about a case in Texas. Uh, I asked for the citation. I haven't gotten it, but I'll read it. But in any event, it Texas is sort of neither here nor there. In South Carolina, there have been numerous communities that have gone through the process that we're going through. And um, no one, to my knowledge, uh, has ever been stricken because it was passed uh, by people elected by full-time residents in the community, but the ordinance affected those who own property in the community who didn't get to vote. Um, it's, I think, universal in the United States that you can only vote in one place. I think it's or maybe hope it's a crime if you try to vote in more than one place. Um, I, in my personal experience, prior to moving to Seabrook, we owned a vacation property um, at the Jersey Shore. There was a referendum that affected a lot of people. I can assure you that, it, but without going into details, it would have uh, passed easily had people who own property in uh, Ocean City been able to vote on it. But in fact, we couldn't vote on it. Um, it was only voted on by the voters, the full-time residents of Ocean City. The result was something that a lot of people didn't like. But nobody that I spoke to ever thought that we should have had the right to vote on that um, because that's that's just not the way it works anywhere. But then there's the question of, well, okay, maybe you have the legal um, right to do that, but uh, I don't know, morally, ethically, whatever, you shouldn't do things that have, uh, that we, that we don't have a say in. And, and on that score, um, I do have to point out that if you that when somebody buys property here, they willingly subject themselves to the covenants of Sapoa. And a lot of people have said, well, if anybody's going to do anything on this, it shouldn't be the town, it should be Sapoa. But um, if you go to the Sapoa covenants, Section four, it states that all zoning regulations for the Seabrook Island development are contained in the uh, plan unit development approved by the town council of the town of Seabrook Island on November 12, 1987. And the land use planning and zoning development standards ordinance of the town of Seabrook Island, as each may be amended from time to time, Property owners and their properties are also subject to all zoning ordinances adopted by the town of Seabrook Island. Such zoning regulations establish the minimum restriction and requirements with respect to land use, density, lot area, setbacks, height restrictions, et cetera. So um, 
since 1987. Any property owner buying on Seabrook has agreed. You may not, frankly, have known you agreed, but it's in the covenants that you agree to when you buy into a property owners or homeowner association like Seabrook. You've agreed that you are bound by the use restrictions of the town. So, um, as with many other use restrictions or physical restrictions, SOPOA can also enact things which can be in addition to what we do. And if they are more restrictive than what the town does, then within the boundaries of SOPOA, you're, you're bound by that. Um, but if it's less restrictive, then it's the town of Seabrook Island that controls. It's basically the most restrictive. And again, this, this is the way it, it has been since 1987. So the town is not only legally, but I believe um, appropriately uh, an entity that is able to address the uh, short-term rental issues. Now, uh, another thing is, as I said, that this is consistent with how many municipalities um, in coastal areas with a lot of short-term rentals uh, regulated. Um, we, we all know that you know, Folly Beach, which has been cited as uh, something where a cap was put on that was very restricted and resulted, according to many people, on uh, diminution of property values. Uh, so not saying in any way that we would copy what Folly Beach did, but Folly Beach was an, a town without a homeowner association, um, but with a whole lot of people who owned properties who didn't live there. And it was the Folly Beach um, Council that appropriately dealt with that. But you, I mean, you can look at that in Hilton Head, um, uh, various, um, I mean, all up and down the coast, regulations have been passed by the towns. Proper homeowner associations are also, again, able to supplement that or do their own. And in that case, and has been the case in um, Seabrook for since 1987, whatever is the more restrictive policy applies. And people have bought properties here um, who've gone through the ARC or any number of things uh, that both the town and Seabrook regulates it. That that's actually been the case. You've actually been subject to that. You may not have thought about it but you've been subject to that the whole time you bought the property, uh, that, that you've owned the property. So uh, I believe that we are on solid ground in examining and considering, and if we believe it to be appropriate in acting various regulations. But none of that is to say that we don't care about short-term renter owners and that we are disregarding their interests. In one of the public forums, the term stakeholders was used. That's fine. Uh, it's a terminology. Uh, I think it's as good as any other to say that we have different stakeholders here. And one of the stakeholders um, is the community of short-term rental owners. And uh, to the extent that people think, <clears throat> excuse me, that they are two separate communities with diametrically opposed interests, um, I think is wrong. I think actually that the interest of full-time residents and short-term rental owners are 
intertwined. And uh, what's good for one can very much be good for the other and vice versa. And what's bad for one can be bad for the other. So I don't view there to be uh, two separate um, <clears throat> groups out here. And it's, it, it's just um, who's fighting and who's, who, who gets to prevail. Um, let's say that legally we, uh, which I believe we do, have the right to eliminate short-term rentals altogether. And, and we do that and we force it through. I think that would be disastrous. I mean, I think that would be, um, well, I don't know, disastrous, I guess is a good word. I would have no intent to do that. Um, it would not only be disastrous for the people uh, in the short-term rental community, it would be disastrous for the long-term, uh, I mean, for the full-time residents here uh, on, on many different levels that we've heard of from the, the life cycle, as I'll call it, of people who are introduced to Seabrook for the first time uh, by renting to the people, uh, to uh, all the way to the revenues that are generated that would then have to be made up by full-time residents. So um, again, I use, as I did in one of the forums, I use extreme examples to illustrate a point. Uh, having known, uh, um, I, I know that some people are probably going to misconstrue that and take out of context and say that I want to eliminate short-term rentals. Um, I can't help that. Um, but um, for those who are listening, who are uh, trying to understand what I'm saying, I'm using that only as an example of how we are not two different groups whose interests are not aligned. I think that um, balancing appropriately shows that there is a community of interest of both short-term renters and full-time residents. And that simply gets to the point that what we need to do in this committee is balance those as best as we can. And, and in my view, not take sort of absolutist or extremist positions. Now, um, obviously, how to do the balance is a tough um, process to arrive uh, at that balance, and but that's what we're here for, and I'm very thankful that I have a, a committee of such um, not only diligent, hardworking people, but people who who have the community's interest, best interest in their hearts. So that is my uh, statement of why I think that the town is entitled and actually should be the entity to regulate. Um, here <clears throat> on short-term rentals. Now, the next major thing is that um, there's no, excuse me, is that there's no problem. And this is articulated in a number of ways. Um, most frequently that we're on a solution in search of a problem. Um, I also uh, disagree with that, I think that there's a problem, and as I'll get into, the problem has calmed down, but that's no reason not to address it now. I was here in the COVID period, I was here more, more relevant in the post-COVID period, let's say 2021. I lived near Boardwalk One. Um, this is just one thing that I would experience. I, I think there's, if you read the comments, there's quite a few different things uh, that people experience. But in the Boardwalk One, for example, the parking was completely uh, overwhelmed. So the Oyster Catcher Community Center 
um, you're not supposed to park around the grass around that. And it's everybody um, parked on the grass, which frankly um, didn't really. I mean, it, it, that's not to say that people who did that are, um, you know, that's that's an example of bad renters. Because frankly, where are they going to park? I mean, there's nowhere else to go. Now, then they started everybody and because the owners have their lot which was generally pretty full but um i think most owners could could fit into the lot the renters um again nowhere to go so that parking around the oyster catcher even though sapoa says you can't do it everybody did it which is okay um in my view not speaking first of all but uh they also parked in everybody's front yards and i know people whose sprinkler heads were broken I mean, it was a mess. And, um, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> they may not be the biggest problem, but they're actually expensive to replace. And, you know, <clears throat> anybody says, well, things have gone down. It, that's true, but I want to get back to what was the situation at the, at the peak, because that's going to tie into what I'm going to say in a minute. Um, the club facilities were overwhelmed, uh, getting any reservation anywhere was very difficult. Part of that, uh, uh, to be fair, was the club was having trouble with, um, staffing. That was 2021 is when a lot of places had trouble with staffing. So it was not only the additional uh, numbers of renters, but also the um, uh, the fact that uh, employers generally were having trouble staffing. But that, but that was a mess. So there were <clears throat> lots of things going on that made it uh, problematic in a bunch of different ways for those of us who were here in 2021. And um, since then, as people have pointed out correctly, the numbers have gone down. There's a couple reasons for that. One is macro reason that people are now traveling abroad or more extensively in the United States, that they're not simply um, heading to the closest coastal communities or mountain area or whatever to have a vacation. They want to um, get away <clears throat> on, on different kinds of trips. And so now you read about how the cruise ships are just jam packed and Europe is jam packed, et cetera. So that means we're not jam packed. And that's, and that's good. Um, and that's all true. The other reason that rentals are down, according to some people, and I'm not disputing it, I just don't know the extent of the impact, is because of policies enacted by um, other entities like the, the club in Sapoa. The club specifically with um, various limitations on when renters can get tea times or the costs of the club, things like that. So again, um, and there was an unpopular uh, towel fee, which has been, it's not gonna, uh, it's gonna be other fees, but that's not gonna happen this summer. Um, so, and that may have an impact. I mean, I'm not saying that it, it doesn't, but whatever the case is, it, it is, uh, the numbers are down and things have, um, return to a, a more no, normal state. Um, but the numbers of short-term rentals have gone up. It's been pointed out that um, the percentage has stayed roughly within a band and it's never gotten more than 25%. And that's true, but the number of short-term rentals 
has gone up around 20%. As a percentage of the island, that's saved roughly stable because of the build out of houses, of additional full time residents. And I do question on an island in which, <clears throat> as many people pointed out, it was uh, built originally with a number of regimes that were focused on short-term rentals, such as the Atrium, Pelican Watch. Um, whether uh, now the fact that the overall percentage has stayed uh, relatively stable because of the fact that there's so much other new construction on the island is, um, is the most relevant metric on that. Uh, I think the fact that you have, um, I don't know whether it's, I forget whether it's 15 or 20 percent more short-term rentals, uh, it, it as an absolute number, is going to add um, more to the crowding. It's going to add more to the overcapacity issues. Um, and I don't know that that was ever expected that it would go up to that level. The uh, and then the question for me is whether there's a, a sort of tipping point at which uh, people don't want to come uh, to Seabrook to live full time or those living here don't want to stay because they are concerned with um, too many um, renters and too few full time people. There uh, are studies that have been referred to in the comments that I'm actually trying to track down, but I, I've read generally about it. And I think that it makes a lot of sense to me that we've only spoken about property values in this process as a one-way street. That if you put a cap on short-term rentals, property values will go down because you're when that um, villa or, or house goes for sale, you won't have people who are in the market for rental properties to um, or, or properties that they could be in part of the time and then rent the other part of the time, they won't be part of the buyer pool. Um, I have spoken to people and again, we're going to try to track down data, but I don't think it's a one-way street. I think it can be the other way in which the buyer pool is cut down for people who don't want um, to be concerned that they're going to be on a street where there's a number of other uh, rental properties. So the, the property value um, consideration is an important one. But I don't think it's a one way street. And I want to make clear that this has nothing to do with renters being bad people. Um, they're not. I mean, there's bad apples, just as there are bad apples in any community, whether it's full time residents, renters, or whatever. It's just that it takes a lot of committed people working to make this community what it is. Um, I, it, it's hard to articulate it, but if you live here long enough, you sort of know it, that when people say they love coming to Seabrook so much and it, it's such a wonderful community, um, I have to think about is that is that just because of the particulars of the land that we're on, the topography that we have? I mean, it's part of it. It's a beautiful place, but it's it's I think more than that. And not to take a shot at Kiowa, we work with them and they're great people, but. A lot of people come to Seabrook because of the sense of community after having looked at Kiowa. And that's not taking into account all the other places up and down the coast. Um, so when 
we hear people say, and many people again, short term caps repeatedly say that they don't want um, they don't want caps, but they but they love Seabrook and they love coming here. I, I think part of it you have to think about why why is that? And uh, to again, it goes beyond looking around and, and seeing how beautiful the land is here. It's because of things like, um, in my view, when you go out on the beach and you try to see the dolphin strand feeding, you saw you you see um, residents there in the dolphin education network who come over and and give you a little lesson in um, in strand feeding and how you can best see the dolphins. And yes, they may actually tell you to stand back. You have to be whatever. 20 feet back from, from the water. Um, those are pretty much full-time residents, my understanding. And it, it's not because full-time residents are inherently better people, it's because we live here. We have the time to do it. It takes time. You have to get educated. You have to go out. You have to volunteer. It's hard to do when you live in Charlotte or Atlanta or Dayton or wherever the case may be. It's just the nature of the beast. And there's, the, I mean, so I picked that one. You could do the turtle patrol, people going out in the morning and having the turtle patrol. People explain what's going on. It's, it, takes, it takes a lot of committed people in the community to make this what it is that makes people want to come and and be and rent it here and make it such a magical place. And it's not, and it is different than going to a Disney World or going to something that's run by a commercial um, uh, developer who who has the hotel and has this and has that. Um, there's a lot of things that could have happened here that didn't because of the committed community. By the way, one thing, because my a lot of people love here, uh, love to come here because the beach is dog friendly, and um, probably a lot of rental properties don't allow dogs, but the but the short term rental owners um, who own the places can bring their dogs, and they may not know that that beach friendly didn't happen by accident. It happened because a lot of committed people in the community, the voters here, lobbied town council years ago to, to be able to, to get, and the organization Sea Dogs was founded uh, in large part for that purpose, to get that done. So, I mean, it could be a hundred things, but when people come and they think it's, I, mean, I guess there's some small number of people who actually don't like dogs off the show the beach, but I'm not in that group. Um, but these things don't happen by accident. And it, and it takes it takes a large community. So um, then the question is um, okay, but it, it doesn't, um, but we're not there yet. We're not, we're not at the tipping point where it becomes more of a commercial enterprise and less of a community. And I agree with that. Um, but I also believe that we could be one big macro event away from having another big crush of renters come, people deciding that they're making so much money from the rental that they're going to get their licenses, and then the numbers go up another 20 or 25%, and that uh, creates a, a huge new problem. In the public forums, uh, it was said, by at least one or not more people, that um, we can't do anything about that because there may be such an event, but we don't know that there will be. And if it um, 
happens, we don't know whether it will be what it will be. We don't know whether it will be a pandemic. We don't know whether it will be a um, civil unrest. So we don't know. So we can't plan for it. And that was a particular statement. But the, but the general theme that we shouldn't do anything until that big event happens and we have another huge influx is um, was was a thing presented by many many people, uh, and my view is that I um, I, I reject that um, view. The best time to plan for something is when you're not in the middle of a crisis, and I referenced before Rahm Emanuel said crisis is a good thing to waste. Um, I think that if you were in a very divided government where in Washington, where nothing gets done, I can see Ron Emanuel's um, uh, thought process, which is nothing gets done except when there's a huge crisis and then we can push something through. I don't think, I'm confident we're not at that point in Zebra. Um, we, we don't need a crisis. We, we need to plan ahead. So why, what, the idea that you don't plan ahead and make sure that we don't have that thing where there's another plateau where we go from this level to this level to this level um, and at some point it's uh, it's too much. The idea that you don't plan ahead is um, not, not something I agree with. I I get an insurance policy on my house. I don't know that anything's going to happen to the house. I hope nothing's going to happen to the house. But if it did, I don't know whether it's going to be a fire. I don't know whether it's going to be um, wind damage and a hurricane. And I don't know whether it's going to be an internal pipe busting, causing a lot of damage. I don't really care. What I do care about is knowing that if something happens, that I have coverage to fix the problem. Another example that I will use is from the industry that I was in, um, the latter part of my career, in the banking industry. And I was in the legal department uh, litiga handling litigation, but we worked very, very closely with the many, many people who were in charge of doing stress tests at a bank. So at a bank, um, the Fed and the OCC require stress tests in which you posit many different types of scenarios of really bad stuff happening. And you don't wait until the bad stuff happens. You, you do it, you do it always, but you do it when the, it's a couple of years ago when times were flush, interest rates were low, the money was pouring in, uh, my bank was making many, many billions of dollars. You, you spend a tremendous amount of time and resources trying to um, figure out what you're going to look like in the event of bad times under different scenarios. It could be um, the Great Recession, except even greater. It could be a run on deposits based on the fact that banks out in California are going under. And your bank, uh, what happens if run on deposits? And if you fail the stress test, meaning that you fail the what your balance sheet is going to look like in the event of these events that no one ever expects to occur or certainly hopes ever will occur, um, then you have to take actions like um, add to your capital um, and increase your capital reserves, decrease your dividend, things like that. So you're taking action in the flush times so that in the bad times, um, you'll withstand and you'll be resilient. And that's how I look at it, which is the problem that we have for those who, and I'm not criticizing, wanted a statement of problem. The problem that we have is not planning ahead for where we think 
uh, we should be in the event that if there's a another thing like COVID where we did have a big influx, we did have a big problem. Um, and in my view, and if you again, if nothing had ever happened and no increase in short term rentals and all of that, then yeah, we probably wouldn't be here. Uh, be here, but we did see what happened before, and knowing what did happen before when we had a big influx to me means that the problem is if we don't plan ahead for the next time. And if the next time never happens, that's fantastic because I have I don't want another pandemic or any of the other things that I can't even imagine what could cause people to want. Uh, to come here and get away from big cities or, or whatever the case is. Some other uh, thoughts on the um, skepticism that there's no problem. Um, one, I have to say that for a lot of people, I think if we were in the midst of a big pandemic type situation, or whatever the case is, and we have a big influx, people would say we can't do anything now. These people are already here. The people have already gotten their short-term licenses. Um, uh, leases have already been signed. You, you gotta wait until the problem calms down. And then when the problem calms down, they say, what's the problem? It's calmed down. So at some point, you just gotta um, get out there and, and, and say, this is, we need to plan for the future. Um, with also everybody saying, what's the problem? I will say, uh, that every other community along the coast, except Isle Palms has adopted short-term rentals, uh, restrictions in most cases, short-term rental caps. So it's a little odd that like everybody's doing it and nobody has a problem. I think the indication that everybody's doing it is the fact we all know uh, that there are problems. I mean, it could also be mass hysteria. I guess that's possible, but I don't uh, think that's the case. Um, a lot of people have pointed us to the, the previous ad hoc committee of the town and have stated that we should closely examine the data that they looked at. They did a great job with the data. We should, um, basically all we have to do is, is update the data that they had and we'll see that there's no problem that we shouldn't do anything. First of all, I think the ad hoc committee uh, put in a tremendous amount of work and they gathered a lot of good data. I've read their reports. And there was a lot of good work in there. I don't agree with all of the conclusions. I don't, I think some of the data is a little misconstrued, but um, we, uh, but overall, I think it was a great effort with a, with a lot of important things that we need to look at. But what a lot of people don't acknowledge or maybe even know it, with respect to the prior ad hoc report is that the, the ad hoc committee recommended caps or recommended a cap. So to the extent that many people against caps direct us to that committee's reports and conclusions, I would also say I'm okay. And that committee recommended a cap. So uh, obviously thought there, there was a problem to be dealt with. And again, maybe the thinking was the problem is what I think the problem is, which is not having a plan in place in the event that, that, that for whatever reason rentals take off and there's no caps in the future, do it now. So, but, but that, that was what the prior committee uh, did. Um, in that, in that regard, I have to note one particular, uh, comment that was received in the portal 
through from a agent, uh, a real estate a broker, super found in real estate, who sort of mocked the whole process that we're going through. And uh, he said he thought it was very funny and that his guess was that um, we'll come up with a cap that at the end of the day uh, doesn't cut back on existing rental numbers, but uh, is like just above the number that we have now, so that he calls it a faux rental limit that won't have any impact. Um, I'm glad he found our process amusing and he thinks that it's fun. Um, I think he's dead wrong, very short-sighted. I'm not saying what I think a cap should be and maybe I could be persuaded with enough you know, people like him that it actually uh, should be lower. Um, and but uh, in all seriousness, I will not be persuaded by people like him to reduce the cap. Um, I'm whatever I think the cap ultimately should be should will be based on the data and the, uh, and the best balancing that I can do. But um, the concept that if that if we were to do a cap that doesn't result in a cutback in numbers, and I, and I think it's universally agreed, everybody would be grandfathered in. So we're only talking about what would happen if if uh, properties, if and when properties are sold, that um, the idea that that we're saying, okay, we've here's where we are, but we're we're not going to go further. Um, I, I think just in terms of absolute numbers, it's quite clear that short-term rentals have been growing and probably will continue to grow. And if we have another macro event, they'll grow quite a bit if there's no cap. So um, again, I don't think it's an illusion uh, by any means if that were what we were going to do, but I'm glad that he was amused in the meantime. So, um, uh, and I want to talk about um, one other thing before I proceed to the next point, which is that um, people have pointed out behavioral problems with certain renters and people then say that they're not just renters, they're, they're full-time residents. And that's absolutely true. So um, what I've been talking about has been, have been things that are just problems caused by the number of short-term rentals that even if you assume that every renter or every renter is an angel, all the renters coming in are absolute angels. There are still problems that are going to be caused in terms of capacity utilization and the to the extent that you don't have a, a let that you have less cohesion in the community and, and fewer short fewer full time residents because of an aversion um, because of wanting to go to a community that that has less short term rentals. Um, so nothing I've said <clears throat> is a knock on the people who come here to rent as a group, and uh, and certainly, absolutely nothing on people who, who own houses, uh, villas, whatever, that they do short-term rental. There have been uh, some people that have uh, spoke, that there were people that spoke in the forum, um, with heartbreaking stories of being maltreated by people who are full-time residents. Um, there's no excuse for rudeness that 
uh, to the extent that there are behavioral things with renters um, that are legitimate, we the work of this committee uh, will include dealing with that so that people have an outlet to have those things addressed. But there's there's no excuse for rudeness um, to people who you think is a renter. And number one, they may not be a renter, but number two, it doesn't matter. There's no excuse for rudeness, period. Um, there are people here who, um, uh, there was a family that inherited a property who um, could not have afforded to maintain, keep the property had it not been for short-term rentals. And they spoke at, at the, the final forum that we did. And they are an absolute wonderful family uh, to have here. And that's, and their, their kids sound great. I mean, it, it's, it's great. It's, it's great that they're here. Um, but again, they're here, they want to get involved more, but it, it's hard to get involved in a lot of the community things when you're going back and forth. And uh, more to the point, <clears throat> we're really glad they're here. And if we take a balanced approach, we can have more and more uh, people like them. But you, by the same token, the fact that any person on the island conceivably could say, um, you know, I didn't rent before, but now I need to. Um, if you take that logic to its extreme, it means that, yeah, we have a cap and be a cap of 100%. Um, and that's not a cap. And so, again, it just gets back to a balance. So, um, my final point, uh, my final topic of addressing what people have said is about getting the data. Um, that we really need to get the data. And on that point, I just want to say I agree with that. And we do need to collect the data. And we will be collecting data. Um, but we don't. Um, but what I like about this process is that we can collect the data and then analyze it and then critique it. I do think that there's a lot of bad data going around. Um, or data that's just taken out of context or, or used incorrectly. Uh, you see a lot of that on uh, social media in which um, people take something that's a poet put out and, and talk about it. And one of the beauties of this committee is when we talk about things of that nature going forward, we'll be able to point out issues. So, um, I just have three examples of things where everybody says, look, there you go, no issue. So um, uh, case closed. And I don't think it's quite that simple. So uh, if you look at the safety and gate access statistics for Sapoa for the final, uh, for the annual that was in the Sapoa annual meeting, I, these to me look incredible at first, and then when I examine them, I'm pretty certain they're meaningless. If you look at uh, the barcode statistics, it's 723,971. Barcode is um, owners and contractors. So I, I think we can all agree that we don't have 723,000 uh, people who live on Seabrook. So um, what that means is that every time somebody goes in and out of the gate, they're um, counted as one of these events. Every time a contractor goes in and out, contractor goes out for lunch, over to the station, they come back, they're, they're, they count as two for the day. Um, every time I go to town hall, that, that counts. But if you look at the other columns, the visitor and the rental, those are just 
the passes that are given out. So if um, a renter is here for a week and goes in and out a couple times a day, goes play golf over at Kiowa, goes to Freshfields, goes into Charleston, that doesn't count each and every time. So um, then if you look at the next page of what Sapoa put out, it's a chart, it's a bar chart. And it's the gate activities, uh, gate activity. And if you look, you'll see that the rental pass count is almost microscopic. You need to get out your, your magnifying glass to see what the rental is. And if you look at the um, barcode vehicle count, it's stupendous. I mean, it, it's like, like a foot long on that, on that bar chart. It's meaningless. It's apples to oranges. One is passes given out. One is, which could be for a two week rental for, for, for two weeks. And two is, um, and, and this, the other thing is people going in and out of the gate. So it, it's apples to oranges, it's meaningless. There may be meaningful statistics. What you're trying to look at is the traffic on the island and who's causing the traffic. So first of all, people, traffic on the island is not really in terms of being an issue. It's not really measured in terms of um, in and out of the gate in terms of most people's issues. It's like traffic on the island behind the gates. And if people go uh, to the pool, to the beach, to the this, to that, it creates traffic. It, it's a meaningless measure just to say, well, whether they've gone in or out of the gate or not. But for, again, for the renters, there's no, there's no comparable measure. It's simply, did you get a, did you get a pass to go through the gate once? So I don't know what the, what the apples to apples things would be. It would, it would probably be looking at, um, uh, the barcode statistics and, and say and and saying more like, well, how many barcodes are there? How many vehicles are there on the island with the barcodes, not how many times they go in and out of the day. Okay, but whatever it is, it's not this. So um, that's just an example of something that a lot of people have cited that we need um, to be much more careful in, in terms of analyzing the data. Another thing is the um, clubs revenue statistics. I'm not sure the, the revenue statistics are interesting only for one reason because they sort of cut both ways. If you, um, people have said that the revenue is roughly 24% of operating revenue. Um, and that, that may be, but, um, some people, what if it were 50%? A lot of people would say, see, it goes to show the club can't operate without renters. And people who, who are members who live here would say, see, I can't get tea times. I can't get, um, I can't get reservations. Uh, if it would, I, the revenue would be replaced by us if it weren't for that. So it's not 50%. I, I'm just saying that that, number sort of cuts both ways. And to me, the real issue is the, is the capacity utilization, not so much revenues. But the revenue number that I don't understand is it doesn't, I mean, the chart that I'm looking at is, doesn't include the dues except at the bottom. So um, it's uh, $12 million in dues. It's sort of not included as part of the operating revenue. The, if you look at tennis, to take one example, the, um, 
it looks like a large part of the um, 61 percent of the revenue from tennis comes from rental debts. And of course, we know that's not true. Um, there is a very large community of tennis and pickleball players who utilize the club facilities extensively, but they don't pay for court time. They, they pay for it from their dues. So, so to say that 61% of the income, operating income for the, the racket club uh, is renters, it makes it makes no sense. I mean, it's just contrary to the facts. If you included the dues that go to to the racket sports, um, the um, so again, it's just an illustration that you have to look at the numbers and 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 not accept things at first glance. The final thing I'll say is that uh, on this is that at one of our um, meetings, uh, one of our forums, there was a uh, statement. We talk, we spoke about the fact that Sapoa now uh, has a full time traffic enforcement person, and that we've had a lot of citations issued. And this started up in October. I would say from what I sort of saw that by the time it really got underway, the full time thing was more like November. And a gentleman got up and said that the vast majority of citations have been to full time residents. And I'm sure that's true, but um, it was, let's say November, December, January, the least, the months with the least renters on the island. Um, what do those figures look like in, uh, what do those figures look like in June, July, and August? So again, it's like jumping to conclusions because of what, of some piece of data that in, out of context looks like something, but, but isn't. I'm not, when we look at figures for an entire year, which we won't be able to do because it won't be that period, that may mean something, but um, but that particular statistic uh, to me didn't mean anything because it's during a period in which there are far fewer renters than there are um, dur during the peak center, peak um, period of year. So, um, I'm about, I am at the end of my um, review of the themes that people have um, stated. And again, we're thrilled that everybody uh, did submit comments and did um, uh, speak. And again, want to state that what many, many, many people spoke about, which is the life cycle of uh, Seabrook rentals historically, of people who have come to rent here, uh, love here uh, with, this, with the island, bought a property and um, uh, used it, used that rental income to be able to be able to carry the property and then they would use it and they would rent it out part of the time um, is something that I do not want to disturb. It's been important. It's been critical to Seabrook over the years. And in some years, it, as people have pointed out, it's been really critical in terms of when the club was in financial straits, et cetera. Um, so uh, I don't want to disturb that, but I, I want to make sure uh, that in the future it does not get out of balance. So um, very quickly, what I'm leaning toward proposing uh, are is a cap. Um, I don't have the number yet because I want to think about it and listen to people and look at the data. Um, the um, 
as I said, it's a balance that I know either whatever happens, there will be people who think it should be deeper, and people who think it should be less. I understand that. Um, uh, that there would be grandfathering if anybody has got um, property. Um, my initial thought is that if the grandfathering, however, would not be transmitted to a buyer, an unrelated buyer, not a, a related buyer would be grandfathered in, but an unrelated uh, buyer would not be able to get the short term rental uh, permit just because they bought from an existing. Um, if, if at that point in the future there were not, um, uh, they were, we were at the cap. Um, that we should, the second that we should certainly look at the split between multifamily and single family. As Deb has pointed out, um, it's not even necessarily easy to define. Um, and we have to look at, at that. I, my guess is that in the town, um, uh, we might have to limit any split um, based on zoning districts. You know, I don't see how we could do anything with um, streets or or little areas. I think would have to be zoning districts. By the way, I also wanted to point out that whatever we ultimately do will be reviewed by legal counsel. So some people um, uh, have said, well, would this be legal or is that be legal? Um, we have hired at the town legal counsel that um, I, I think is terrific law firm. And we're not going to be, um, we're not going to be submitting an ordinance uh, to counsel that, that hasn't been reviewed by legal counsel. Um, perhaps, uh, number three, perhaps minimum day restrictions for larger homes, uh, and then maybe with exceptions for weddings, um, or uh, since Martin funerals, um, that's, there's a lot of things on both sides of that issue, but um, it's the the villas. Um, I think do get a lot more um, shorter stays, um, and and there's also would be a distinction between in season and out of season for that. Uh, something that I haven't spoken about yet, but which. Um, there actually seemed to be a fair amount of agreement. I didn't notice um, uh, hardly any opposition, even among people who are opposed to caps, which is restrictions on corporate ownership. Um, and by that, I do not mean family owned LLCs. I'm talking about uh, businesses that operate um, purely for the investment. As many, 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 many people pointed out, the um, the family owners um, wouldn't do this as an investment because you can't make money on it, and and I understand that. But um, by the same token, it it shouldn't be a problem to restrict um, sort of purely investment plays, uh, whether it be a corporation or, or a local investor who wants five houses um, for investment purposes, uh, I would would also include in that. And again, since everybody says you don't make money on it, that shouldn't be a problem um, anyway. And then something that we haven't uh, spoken about, and I'm only going to say in very general terms, because I think there is a lot of a, a lot of um, agreement on this, is that we need uh, certain conduct regulations, whether it be noise or trash or towels or whatever hung out, um, and we're going to be doing that work. 
I don't think that, um, as I said, there's a lot of dissent that we do need some of that. The only thing I'll say there is that there, there will probably be, at the end of the day, a lot of overlap with things that SOPOA already regulates. And um, I don't view that as a bad thing, because I'll be blunt and with um, due regard to my friends at SOPOA. Um, and in that regard, full disclosure, my wife is on the board of SOPOA. Um, I think we do enforcement better than SOPOA does. And so you can have the same exact regulation, but we can't enforce it if it's not on the town's books. It's only enforceable for our people um, if, if it's on our books. And we should work with SOPOA. We should always endeavor to work with SOPOA and the club. Um, to do this in a coordinated fashion, but we can't, uh, in my view, we can't rely on SOPOA to do the enforcement. Um, I think, um, I just think we're better at it and um, we, we need to take that responsibility. So I apologize for the length of time that I've gone. Um, I would, say that hopefully that all the other members of the committee will not go quite as long as I did, but you know what? Um, there was gonna be a meeting in town hall this afternoon that got canceled, so we'll go at it. Uh, <laughs> I think um, in terms of the remarks of, of everyone, we'll do a little bit differently. We'll start with Deb, and we'll go to the other side, and we'll go to the side that. So, um, Deb, why don't you take it away? Okay. Um, little, 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 little. My background is finance. So obviously I look at numbers and statistics and things like that. Um, and I'm on the long range planning committee for the SAPOA and I've been on it for quite a number of years. So I went back to the 2022 survey because we're in the process of putting together the 2024 survey. So I went back to the most recent one. And because of some properties have combined there was a total of 2,590 properties, and that includes undeveloped property. I asked Heather just for a rough estimate of how many undeveloped properties are on the island before we reach full build out. She said about 170. So that leaves 2,420 2, properties that are developed on the island. And out of that 2,420, as we know, go ahead, Joe. Was that just? Yeah, you know, why did that include properties outside? I got the impression that it included the Peak of Marina. And, and it definitely includes Salt Marsh and Bay Point. Yeah, because our number is higher, but we include. Maybe Bo maybe not Bow Pickett, but I know it does include Bay Point and uh, Salt Marsh. And was it only the developed lots that could be developed? She might have taken undeveloped lots. The 170. The, one, uh, the 170. Some of them are non buildable. And she did. And she did say, like, there's 170, but some of them yeah, are mm -hmm. non billable and they might get uh, donated to Conservancy at some point. Yeah. And she said that was rough. She she just gave me a rough idea. So when we're gathering statistics from SAPOA, we should refine that. But what the point I'm trying to make is with 2,420 properties, and right now there's 589 rental permits, you can see the majority of the owners just in the developed property are not short term rental owners. Um, I noticed in the public forum, it was a very, uh, a lot of people that have short term rentals are involved in managing short term rentals that made presentations or presented their position. But if you read the hundreds, I didn't count how many comments are out there on the portal. And I'm only up to March 8th, so you might know how many. There were 484 submitted. So far. as of like one o'clock yesterday, I have a couple of stragglers that would be added in um, that were not submitted via the forum. Okay, so I plan on reading all of them. But About I'm only up pages. Okay, I'm only up. I'm only up to March 8th. But if I if I exclude the people that thought we were going to eliminate short term rentals because I knew that that was never a goal of the committee, and I lost count a number of times. Daryl clarified that, and then I focused on the other comments. There are a lot of full-time residents and even people that own here that don't rent that make comments in the portal. They were, I guess, too shy to make it you know, public, but there is um, 
there are a lot of people that support the caps and then there obviously are, are short-term rental people that are worried about the caps um and i i looked into folly beach a little bit and folly beach had approximately 1200 rental properties but when they applied a cap they applied at 800 and i thought well now that was crazy because they created an issue right out of the gate and they might have grandfathered in that other 400, but I just thought they kind of set them up. So I did mention that to Daryl that if we do recommend, because this is just a recommendation, if we do recommend a cap, I, I think we want to be a little careful on what that would be um, and not to hurt anyone, you know, that's currently has rental property. Um, being the finance person that I am, I rented for six months in 2003 when we first bought our cottage and we didn't make any money and we had so much damage and so many bad experiences that I was lucky enough to take it off the market for 11 years. We just came here as often as we could as a second home and then moved here full time in 2014. But what I've observed in all the years that I've been here, um, although the rentals have stayed between anywhere from 19% up to 25%, obviously when you have more developed property, um, you're, you, we have more rentals. And from a marketing standpoint, I think we've reached a point where we have so much rental property and demand is decreasing right now because as Daryl pointed out, people are going to Europe and you know going on cruises in other areas. We have such a supply that now the demand is not meeting the supply. And that's why a lot of people are even making less money on their rentals now than what they used to because we have... I don't want to use a glut, but we just have an overabundance of rental properties. And so I've noticed in the market for rentals, they've gone up and down and up and down. Since 2003, we've had some active years and then we've had some really quiet years. Um, and I think the risk that you take with a short term rental, you have to be prepared for the down years, which is where we're at right now. But you have a lot of competition out there. And that's another reason why your uh, demand of your property is probably down is because you have a lot of competitors in the island and Kiowa. So, you know, you want to keep that in mind. Um, I do agree that we probably have common areas like um, enforcement of, you know, the ordinances. I'd really like to see the town, Sapoa, and um, the rental companies to update one database and we could look at the town database because you have a form you can fill out when you have an issue. I think, you know, we need to recommend that we try to gather data in one place and deal with the problem properties that are not, that are poorly managed because that's part of the complaint from the full-time residents and even my part-time, I'm in summer wind, there's 66 cottages, 37% of our cottages are now rentals. Um, I have about 10% that are full-time residents. And so I'm always balancing as president of summer when the full-time residents, the, the rental properties, and then the part-time people that come down and stay. So it's juggling and lucky me, they all have my phone number and, and I get calls a lot of times. And when you have a good rental company like Nancy's, I post will getaways. If I have a problem, you know, I would call Nancy and they would come and help me or I had excellent experience with code enforcement officers at the town. So I've been here long enough to know, should I call town code enforcement officers? Should I call suppose security? Should I call a rental company? Who should I call depending on what the problem is? And I didn't update the database at the town all the time. So there's nowhere to capture the adventurers and they weren't all Nancy's uh, rental properties. There's nowhere to capture other than my experience. I've been present in the summer with probably at least eight years of the adventures that I've had. Um, I do think that if this group gets into a nuisance ordinance, it shouldn't be limited, focused on just short-term rentals. I think it should be island wide because I've had adventures with owners that the code enforcement officers have helped me with because they were new owners. Um, I've had problems with the children of owners. I've had problems with family guests and renters. So I've had the whole gambit um, so I think from a nuisance ordinance standpoint, we should look at an island wide uh, and, and really look at, at everyone and not isolate the short term rentals. But I think the reason the short term rentals is targeted is it's the only thing that we can still control from a capacity utilization standpoint. We can't control 
how many owners live full time on the island and how many of their family guests come. And we can't stop someone that has a lot and wants to build on it. So from a capacity and utilization standpoint, unfortunately, the only area that we can try to control is short term rentals. So I think people take offense to that, but that's really the only avenue we have. Um, everybody bought here because of the beach and the environment and the wildlife and the, and being a gated community. So if you ask any owner, no matter what full-time, part-time, short-term rental owner, we all bought for the same reason. So I feel like we're trying to do something to protect that. And when I look, listened or looked at all the comments from short-term rental owners, there was a quite a large volume of them that said, well, I'm renting right now, but I plan on moving there full-time. So hopefully they understand you bought here for a reason. You want to move here full time for a reason. I'm one of them. So let's try to protect that in any way we can. I think that's a joint opportunity between the town, SACOA, and the club. I came from the Long Range Planning Committee, uh, SACOA Long Range Planning Committee, before I came here. And our chair, uh, John Lasseter, pointed out his, um, and he's already working on it, of reaching out to the club and he's going to reach out to the town because he sees the opportunity for all three entities to work closely together. So I thank Daryl for the fact that we're also leading there. You know, we're not in a bubble. We're not just looking at, you know, the, this small window. We're, we are reaching out to SAPO and talking to them about short-term rentals. We're reaching out to the club to understand the impact from the utilization standpoint. As a COVAR president, I've already sent out an email to all the presidents of all 41 regimes and associations to ask their input on caps. And we know that some already have caps. Um, I have maybe only got 41. The last time I looked, I think I had 10 responses, but it was interesting. Some are considering it. Some are talking about caps. Um, three, we think, have approved it. I haven't heard from them yet. So if I don't hear from them, I will call them to understand that's horseshoe code. Uh, Charleston Place and um, Salt Marsh. So I will get details. I have a number of questions that I ask if you do have a cap. I am asking them, you know, when was it effective? Is it part of your bylaws? You know, is it a percent or a number? Um, are you have any issues that you noticed since you created a cap or you have any challenges managing it? Um, have you noticed any real estate or property value impacts? So I didn't just ask you the cap yes or no. I, I put together a spreadsheet that I'm asking various questions and I'll be sharing that with the whole group and then can become part of the town documentation. But I'll make sure that I get 41 people giving me their answers. But um, I do think that there's a lot of common ground that we can accomplish through this exercise. I know we're just making a recommendation. But I appreciate the fact that, first of all, we were formed to come together and really look at the bigger picture because I worked with the ad hoc group before, and they didn't talk to that many people. So when you look at who they interviewed, and now you look at who we've interviewed, you know, that we've gathered a lot more data, and now we're even going to get more detail in the data than the ad hoc committee ever made. And they did recommend a cap at the end of their analysis, but it was at the end of last year, and when they didn't get reelected, they did not present that that change in the ordinance. So they had come to that conclusion, even though they had, you know, talked to that many people. But I appreciate the fact that we had public forums and we have the comment database that people can comment. And it's opened my eyes to some things, even though I've been here for so many years, it did open my eyes to some of the things that I, I didn't realize. Um, and I agree with Daryl to be rude to anybody. I always try to be friendly. I don't ask them, are you an owner? Are you a renter? You know, it's like, you know, I try to be nice to anyone. So that I have some other things, but that's kind of my position right now is that I would like to entertain doing something that will make everybody happy. So I believe in the word compromise. So we need to come up with a compromise that meets the full-time residents the part-time residents that don't own short-term rental property and the owners of short-term rental property come up with various compromises that they can all live with. So that's my score. Thank you, Deb. I will um, only say that I think in this world it's impossible to make everybody happy. Yes. <laughs> but but um, my goal is to try to make everybody least unhappy as possible. Yeah. 
What was some of the challenges? I'm going to let um, Ali take my spot. I want to push back a little bit because I'm not sure how much I want to say. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Um, I'll start by saying first that I've been the best man in several weddings and I found my best toast were ones that I prepared for versus winging it. So I, I've written down a few things. So if I'm looking down and reading a little bit, I apologize. I, I normally don't do that, but I want to make sure I don't miss things. So with that, I'll start. I would like to thank both Daryl and the city council for giving us this opportunity to participate in this. I know that's it was a mouthful because some people look at me and go, why are you doing this? Um, the community's involvement in these discussions so far has been nothing but outstanding. Um, I was shocked. I mean, I was tired and shocked at the four and a half hours we spent on that Zoom meeting. Uh, I never thought that we'd have that type of turnout and we had it multiple times. So that was pretty impressive. Uh, Honestly, I'm still working through my views, um, but I am willing Daryl's request to share kind of where I stand right now. Um, I'll just preface it by saying these are my thoughts. You know, we haven't really gone through the serious data gathering or the give and take between us as a committee. My sense is that my views may swing some as we go through that process, but you got to start somewhere, so that's what I'm doing. And that's that's the point here. Which yeah. I mean, hopefully, I made clear that everybody should be subject to evolving their views. Yeah. Um, you know, I, we need to have a consistent set of data to support our recommendations to city council. Um, you know, even though I praise the community for participating in their in the forums and stuff, I saw a lot of what I'll call the same data being used differently to each of their own views of kind of advantage. And I think it's really important for us as a, as a committee to research the data and come to agreement on how we're all using the data. It's less about how others use it, but we gotta make sure we're using it consistently. Um, and Daryl has asked me, since I brought this up to him yesterday, would I be willing to graph what I think what data we should be gathering as a straw dog to kind of look at to start that process? And then as opposed to just start with a blank sheet of paper, I'll pull together what I think would be good data for us to look at. And again, I will encourage all of you to come in with ideas of what data you think we need, and then together we'll agree on what that is. Um, you know, why is that important? You know, I said that many of us were offering have facts in the presentations that were, were conflicting. So I think we just need to get comfortable with what we look at um, and how we define this data is just terribly critical. Um, uh, the word data was used a lot over the last four or five meetings. Uh, I personally don't believe data is going to give us the answer. Data may help us make a decision but I believe that much of this the issue is, is, is really more of an emotion-based issue versus a fact-based issue. And no matter how many facts we pull together, my sense is we may sway some opinions, but we're not gonna, we're, there's still gonna be a group of individuals out there that are gonna ignore the facts and just remain very emotional, which goes to the fact that we'll probably not make anybody happy it's how can we make them all the least unhappy it's kind of the same thing uh, i am a firm believer that if there were proper rules in place uh, with short-term rentals and the community at large because i agree rules need to apply to everybody uh, and, and, and those rules come with real enforcement uh, many of the issues that have been identified by everybody probably wouldn't be as big a deal as what they are today. Um, it doesn't mean the problem would have gone away because there are other things besides just proper behavior. But uh, I think some of the emotion may be, would, might be a little better check if we, if, if, if we had rules and we had them enforced. Uh, rules without enforcement, honestly, is simply a waste of time. Um, 
So I think that's real important and hopefully coming out of this will be at least a, uh, a behavior ordinance of some kind, whether it's from this committee or city council does something with a broader community because it's beyond just renters. That's kind of up to them. Uh, I do believe that single family homes and villas or condos, whatever we want to call them, uh, should be treated differently. Um, uh, license fees for a five bedroom home versus a one bedroom villa should not be the same. I, 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 I never understood that. Um, I'm going to talk more about caps in a minute, uh, but I think capping villas versus single family homes should also be different. Uh, I believe Seabrook's lifeline truly is people renting on the island, buying a small place, renting if they need to offset some costs, and ultimately buying a single family home to retire here. Uh, I know everybody doesn't do that, but I think there's a we heard from an awful lot of people that either have done it or that's their plan to do it. And, and I think it would be just a big mistake to cut that lifeline off. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about minimum stays. Again, another area where I think villas and single family homes uh, could be or should be treated differently, especially during, and I'm not sure what the busy season is. I know I heard we use June, July, August earlier. I, I wrote down May, June, July, August, September. Um, I think we have a long summer period. So I, I think it's a little, it's more than just the traditional summer. Uh, I think, but many people take advantage of the short stays to attend events. Um, I mean, weddings is the common term. Daryl, you had funerals. I didn't think of that one. That's kind of gruesome. Um, I think I got that answer. Somebody said it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it, there's been a lot of talk about people renting during the holidays and that type of thing for overflow. I would hate to see us put in a, a week or two week minimum that would just preclude people from being able to take advantage of, of that situation or force them when they come to have to stay at the Andel Inn in July at $500 a night. I mean, I just think that would be just atrocious. Uh, and again, I think the short term villas are better positioned to, to have the shorter stays. I think having establishing some kind of a minimum, maybe during the peak season for the larger homes, might make sense to create a little bit more stability in the in the single family homes area and eliminate. And again, I've never come across it, but I trust that has happened. The two day weekend rental where there's bachelorette parties or bachelor parties or or wedding celebrations that get out of control. So maybe you can we can have requirements different for the bigger units versus the small units. Okay, I think I've finally gotten to what I'm gonna pull the white elephant in the room and that's caps. Uh, for me, honestly, the jury is still out. I said any cap established should not take away any current homeowner's right to rent. If it affects future homeowners, I'm not sure I like that, but at least they know what they're getting into when they purchase their home. But I'd hate to see us um, effectively backtrack on people who've already made their decision based on one set of rules and now we'll be pulling the rug out from under them and that's probably a, quite a bit of disruption in their lives. Will caps affect property values? And the best I can come up with is probably yes, but it could go, in my mind, it could go in either direction and could be different in the short term versus the long term. Um, you know, Many things affect property values, and I don't believe there's a definitive answer as to what would happen if a cap were put in place. And it probably even depends on where the cap is set at. So if that, I think that's a very difficult one, and I, I'm not sure there's an easy answer to that one. So I'm kind of just discounting it in my mind. Do I believe that cap? I, I do believe the caps that restrict the number of properties that can rent will only help those that rent improve their occupancy. Um, the, the demand to come here is strong. And other than the 4th of July week, I believe the volume of renters on the island would remain close to the same, which defeats the purpose of the pro cap movement. 
if I have a bunch of properties that are at 50% capacity and now I limit the number of properties that can rent, those that are 50 will just move to 75. Because I think the demand to come to the island is there and they're just going to go to another unit. So if the goal is to limit the number of people or the amount of traffic, I, I'm not sure a cap is going to do that. Unless, unless you set the cap at a level um, uh, what I'll call a severe cap, which was similar to what they did in uh, Fallow Beach, which I, I wouldn't support. I don't think a, a cap, other than the extreme busy weeks, will really affect the volume of people on the, on the, coming on the uh, uh, island. Uh, I, I believe that the action to date by the town, the club, and SAPOA, they've taken, there's been a lot of things happening in the last couple of years, and I'm not sure it's a cap, but I kind of call it a pseudo cap. Uh, increasing the fees that drive rental rates up will adversely affect the volume of people coming to the island due to, based on affordability. And I only manage, I mean, I own one rental and I help others, a couple others, and we are having to raise our rates significantly because of all the increasing fees. And I'm a believer in economics, and we often we've, we've thrown around the terms of supply and demand, but I, there's also a price aspect. And, and I have a whole lot of fear as I've been raising my own rental properties rates that I will start to affect occupancy. So and that's a that's a view of economics as well. And you know, I, I'm not sure we we've, we've come out of COVID where we clearly have seen a drop. But we've also seen a significant increase in rental rates. I don't know what's driving the, the drop in rentals. Is it the function that we're out of COVID and people are, are, are going elsewhere? Or is it a function that we've all raised our rates so much that people are can afford to go someplace else? It, it, my view is probably some of both. Uh, I'm almost done with that. Uh, yeah, and again, I mentioned a couple of properties that I'm involved with. They are very small. They're, they're, they're one or two bedroom high handings. And I can assure you with the ever increasing costs that are going on on the island, that's going to deter commercial financial investors. At best, those who rent are simply offsetting some of the costs of the property of ownership. They do not make money on and sophisticated financial investors know that and put their money elsewhere. I just don't see, it, it, unless somebody's making a, a real estate play in their portfolio, and, and most portfolios, you have some money invested in real estate. They make, make money over time because properties, real estate goes up and down. That's how they're making their money. They're not making money on this island by renting their properties because the costs are significant. And I only make money on mine because I do my own cleaning. And I think I shared with Daryl, I make as much money cleaning a property as I do owning and cleaning a property, which tells you owning a property doesn't make anything. So, and again, I, I know that I don't want to overly generalize. I'm talking about one and two bedroom high handed units. Uh, uh, other properties, maybe their economics are a little different, but the ones I'm dealing with, I'm not getting wealthy, nor are other people getting wealthy by by doing that. Um, you know, candidly, I recognize that council, or at least a portion of the new council, ran on this subject, and, and I suspect that we're going to put caps in place of some kind regardless of what the committee recommended. Uh, I, I believe that, that that was their platform and I believe that that will likely happen. My hope is that council thinks it through thoroughly before acting. You know, Daryl, you mentioned before stress testing and, and I think this is a situation that requires some stress testing. Um, it's these of you know these macro events that you refer to could really change the opinions of the people on the island. A, 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 a massive economic change in our economy could have a whole bunch of people who currently own and don't rent 
wanting to rent their properties. So they would clearly flip them from one side to the other. Now, we don't know what that is. We don't know when it's coming. But all I would suggest is that the action we take can come with unintended consequences. And I think we need they need to be anticipated and, and, and studied to the extent possible so we don't find ourselves in a situation where we put rules in place and in five years or 10 years, there's another group of people sitting up here trying to unwind what is going to be taking place from this action. Um, you know, again, I'm going to reiterate, I think, um, you know, I, I expect there to be caps. I think they need to be thought through and put in at the proper, if they're going to be caps, they need to be put at the proper position uh, so not to penalize uh, people who currently rent their properties. Uh, I, I still believe that a significant benefit can come from this issue by putting behavioral rules in place with enforcement. Again, it won't solve all the problems, but I think it would go a long way of appeasing the community to know that things are, that they're not dealing with people who are out of control. And if they do get out of control, they have an avenue to um, to have it dealt with, as opposed to, I think many people now just throw up their hands and complain and don't know what to do. Yeah, I, I'm guessing there's things I should have talked about and had missed, um, but I think I've taken enough of your all's time. I do look forward to working with all of you over the next few weeks to see if we can pull something together that can work for the community as all. Well. Okay, thank you, Alan. Um, We'd say it'll be looking forward to working with us over the next few weeks. Months. I'm only to put a schedule out for the next few weeks. That doesn't mean we won't have to go beyond. I'm going with the job. Don't, that... don't think that don't don't think that it's only going to be a few more weeks. Um, yeah, I, I'm thinking trying to honor the June deadline because you know I, the, that was the mayor's goal, and I think at this stage we should do the best we can to try to achieve that. Um. Right, which is more than a few weeks. Yeah. Um, Ted? Um, first of all, I want to state that, you know, I believe that short-term rentals have a place and are very important to the overall community here on Cedar Island. With that said, we're not John's Island. We're not James Island. We're not Myrtle Beach. Probably IOP is probably the closest that we could look at as far as similarity. And then we have our sister across the way, Kiowa, very, very similar to us. But yet Seabrook is, it's a gem. We are a sustainable property. People come here because of the beaches, the wildlife, the birds, of the sense of community, everything that you can join from photography to history groups, to all the, to Marja, to all the different things that are available to you when you are here. My part of the equation is, is, is that I want to help to protect for the future the community. Meaning, I want to be able to walk down the street and not get run over. I want to be able to meet people walking a dog, meeting your neighbors on a corner. There's so many times I see groups of people, three, four, five, six people off to the side talking, just sitting there in the sun, smelling the roses, having a conversation. That's a big part of what Seabrook and living here is all about. I want to help to protect the community within the residences of the streets of Seabrook. There is a place for STRs. 
we can look at different zoning maps. I'm hoping that we can get these zoning maps and we can do some type of a digital zoning map where we can all see exactly where the rentals are. Are they in small villas, single family? Are they in one bedroom? Are they in two bedroom? Are they in homes? Are they in massive homes along the beach? We are so diversified, but yet we have the opportunity right now. And I'm not gonna say it's a problem. I'm gonna say it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to try to, if we didn't have that gate, imagine what Seabrook would look like. Just drive over to Folly Beach. You'd see exactly what it would look like. And I wouldn't want to live on Folly Beach, but that's me. But people come here for the peace and quiet. They come here for the community. They come here for a lot of reasons why when we first came here, we looked at Sea, we looked at Kiowa, and we came away shaking our heads. And we drove over to Seabrook and we go, wow, this is what we want. It's nice here, it's quiet. It's so important to appreciate this gem that we have and to not let it alter, which it can happen if we don't plan for the future now. I'm not, I agree with Ali. I'm not trying to put any due burden on any current homeowner that is in Seabrook Island. What we do need to put in place rules and regulations that if you're going to become a future homeowner, you know what you're up against. You know what you're buying into. You know exactly what your costs are going to be. It's unfortunate that we have all these fees that have been built up over the past few years that have made it more difficult for people to rent where their profitability is down where their ROI is down. It's, it's unfortunate. Now, maybe somebody thought that that was a great way to stymie rentals on Seabrook. I don't think it was the right way to do it. I really don't. I think that we want people to enjoy this island. We want people to come here. And yes, there are high rental seasons and there are low rental seasons. However, those geographical areas, if we have a digi digitalized map that can show, we can all look, meaning all of us can look, not just this committee, not the town, everybody can look to see what's going on and where it's going on. And to be able to potentially look into, okay, this zone is STRs, this zone right here is not. It's medium-sized lots that have homes on it. They're neighborhoods. A gentleman got up and spoke about how he didn't know his next-door neighbor. Well, I know my next-door neighbor, and I know my next-door neighbor over here, and I know my neighbor down there, and I know my other neighbor going this way. And I know who they are. But I also know that there are homes within the residence. So my focus is not so much on short-term rentals in villas and one and two bedrooms. It's more about the neighborhood. And I want to protect the neighborhood. But yet I don't want to stymie anyone that has already made a financial commitment to buy a home in a neighborhood or to potentially build a home in a neighborhood already and has made that commitment thinking in the back of their mind, Oh, I'm going to rent this thing. I'm going to make a fortune. Or I'm not going to make any money. It's going to pay the mortgage. So down the road, I can then move here and retire here. These are all things that we need to take into consideration as a group. I think having updated data is so important. I, I do disagree with you. I think that we need to be data-driven. 
and not so much emotional driven on this decision. I think we need to look at the numbers and I think that we need to plan for the future with those numbers. I think the caps are important. I think that they need to be reasonable. And I think that if we don't plan for the future, shame on us. Shame on us for not planning for the future. I think that there is a big difference between a villa and a home in a neighborhood. I think there's a big difference. But we need to be able to turn around and put into place, a lot of it is already existing, rules and regulations, not to overburden people, but to be able to say, these are the rules and regulations, this is where you can go to report this and make it easier on people to be able to report this and then be able to have someone that will actually enforce this, put some teeth in it, put a bite in it, make it so that people feel that they're going to be able to know that when they're in Seabrook, they're going to be safe. They're going to be protected. Their properties are going to be protected. Their overall sense of community is, going, again, going to be protected. And I think that having enforcement, and we didn't talk, I don't think we talked enough about it. I, I heard more about the business side of the rentals, the renter, property owners, concerned about their income. And I would have liked to have heard more about suggestions on how to how they would like to see us enforce the rules and regulations that we want to put into place. Whether it's whether it's the town, we already have enforcement officers, whether we give them more jurisdiction to be able to work with the community, to be able to, to, to utilize them, or, or whether we have another person that is just an enforcement office. I do agree that we need to get all three, as my wife likes to say, a, a, a triangle. You've got the club, you've got the SPOA, and you have the town. And a, a triangle here, and we need to get all three working together, moving in the right direction together. It's not going to be easy. Don't think it's going to be easy. It, it, it's not. I, it's funny. When I first moved here, I found that I thought the club was the least transparent. Now I think that, that, that Sapoa is by far the least <clears throat> transparent. And it's not going to be easy to get them to move, to work with us, to try to take care of certain things that are important to the community and the people that live here. I guess in closing, I'd just like to say, I love it here. And I'm gonna do whatever I can. And we're just here as a recommendation. We can't make any rules, we can't make any regulations. Town council can do what they wanna do, whether they agree with us or not. But I, I have the feeling that they really have empowered us to bring them good information, good solid recommendations that they can feed off of and make a good recommendation themselves with new rules and regulations. Thank you. Yeah. Is it okay if I go? Because I unfortunately have to get back to the hospital. Absolutely. <laughs> so my stay here is going to be cut short. <laughs> I should um, point out that um, for anybody watching, Star is not saying she has to go back and be a patient. No, no. <laughs> She's a, a nurse um, right. in the uh, on, on oncology field that we're very uh, honored to have uh, her spend. Yeah, I was supposed to be today. off today, but we had a lot of illness. Mm -hmm.
provider region. So thank you, sir. Um, and I can jump ahead, but I don't want to miss my opportunity and I do need to head back. But um, I did want to piggyback a little bit off um, what Ted was saying because I also have a similar idea of trying to kind of lay out a map so we can get a visual of kind of where maybe there are higher concentrations or higher density of short-term rentals. Um, so we can have a visual and, and you know, whether it's kind of uh, looking at how that's zoned and taking that into account. Um, I would say I, I feel like from the, the vibe that we are probably a cap of some kind is is almost inevitable. I just want to make sure as we're kind of exploring that and figuring out how to implement that, that we um, are fair. And to that end also with the regimes that the research that you're already doing, Deb, with kind of finding out which regime, regimes are implementing CAPS, have already implemented CAPS, or talking about implementing CAPS um, within their um, independent boards, and maybe looking at the ones that already have and just kind of seeing if, if they've okay. done it, when they implemented it, and if there's any property value data that we could extrapolate from just that kind of um, micro population within our greater population that might give us some useful data as people keep going back and forth about whether caps will hinder property value growth or enhance property value growth. Um, in terms of rental data, I think I would like to, you know, at some point get with Nancy as she probably has the treasure trove of data in terms of what is our peak season, what is the average um, rental rate per night. I think it's very reasonable to set a minimum. I think that was an issue that came up, like we should not have a property renting for $55 a night. Um, uh, but needing to kind of look at the data for our short-term rentals currently and what is our average night minimum? What is our average night maximum? What is the average um, night stay in Memorial Day through Labor Day versus, you know, October through March, those kind of, that kind of data I think is useful just in kind of identifying what our rental trends are um, currently and then figuring out, you know, as we talk about an ordinance and enforceability of this ordinance, which I agree with, like I do think we should have some, you know, a nuisance ordinance or whatever you want to call it, behavior ordinance, conduct ordinance with some enforceability. But I think in, in order to kind of put that into place, we need to know when is our island at greater capacity and how do we then account for hiring extra people to be here to enforce that. We can't expect one enforcement officer to manage you know, enforcement of these things. If we know our maximum capacity is between May and August, we need to look at, you know, the feasibility of having the um, financial resources to hire additional officers or enforcement people during peak season and then flex back down and when it's not peak season. So I think there's some room there to kind of look at those numbers and figure out, you know, how to effectively kind of manage the enforceability aspect. Um, so I think another thing that's been such a common theme is COVID and what if there's another COVID type thing or an economic downturn? And this is just a general question that I don't know the answer to, which would be, is there room for the town to have an emergency ordinance in place that would supersede any other ordinance on the books in a time of another COVID type emergency or something like that, where the town could then say, we're activating an emergency ordinance due to these circumstances. And as of this date, only property owners are allowed behind the gate and eliminate short-term rentals if we had some kind of catastrophic occurrence again, so that we're not dealing with um, kind of what we dealt with with COVID and could something like that supersede what we put in place as a short-term rental ordinance if it's enforced under an emergency action, kind of like if we have 
a hurricane. And if the like uh, again, I, I grew up on Isle of Palms during Hugo, and after Hugo, if, if you couldn't get back on the island, and less than even still, if you don't have your little property owner sticker. So I mean, I think there's room to kind of even maybe examine down the road some type of catastrophic emergency ordinance that um, could be there for protection for something like that to if it occurred again. And just to clarify, there was. <clears throat> there were emergency ordinances put in place during COVID um, consistent with state law that um, said you should be no short-term rental. So there's actually, during the, the height of COVID, there, there were restrictions, restrictions. restrictions consistent with state law. Um, and, that, and that sort of thing. I mean, in, like in a pandemic. During her hurricane evacuation, too, we were trying to make sure all the short term rentals evacuated, and the challenge here is communicating with them. So, if you have a big rental company like Nancy manages, that's one thing. But, you know, Ollie, again, you're here, so that's great. But to try to communicate with all the people that manage rental companies and have a, a hurricane, which it sounds like this season could be iffy. Um, how do we get all the short term rentals off the island in addition to the owner? Because some owners won't leave and there's nothing you can do about that, but at least get short term rentals. So that was another thing I was just thinking about. That was a, another theme is, I, you know, if someone's renting or there's a renter or I don't know who to contact, what if we have a directory? I mean, what if there's a directory available for residents of the island with? kind of that contact information, whether it's password protected on the website. So you can go and say, who do I contact about this property? Or who is, you know what I mean? Because I know the town that, has that, right? Because it's on the uh, everybody's our short term rental permit and their business. Yeah. So they can they call right. the town and get that information? We do have that, but it's also if, if we're speaking about this in terms of tracking enforcement as well, then enforcement violations should probably be reported to the town rather than having private citizens placing every time a neighbor reaches out directly to the management company or the owner that's one potential violation we don't know about yeah. and if we don't know about it there's nothing we can do about it so we always encourage people to notify us so one we can document it and two we can investigate it, three, and if necessary, take appropriate force and action. When people take it into their own hands, nothing we can do. Yeah. Well, and the inverse of that is, is if it's happening in the middle of the night, then they're, they're getting no action, so the person's frustrated. Because the, obviously, you guys can't stay up. You may stay up 24-7, but you probably should get some sleep. So. No, I, 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 um, I want to let Star finish your thoughts, but that's something that we'll be exploring. and. Um, Joe, um, you don't know this yet, but my, <laughs> my plan is to explore it in our next meeting, but we'll talk about that. Um, but to start one. Yeah, no, that was just, you know, it's, it's, I think there's just a lot of uncertainty. People don't know who to contact about issues. And I think it kind of goes back to what the theme is about SAPOA and the town kind of working together to kind of come from the same place in terms of certain things. And I hear that's going to be a challenge, but if the town is enforcing it, I think, you know, I just think we need to make sure that we give the town the resources it needs to enforce it. And I think an important part of that, again, is just kind of looking at times when it's high volume and making sure we provide the resources to the town that they can kind of flex out staff when they need more and, because otherwise, you can't expect the same number of people to do the same job year round when the population increases and decreases. And so, I think to that end, I would be curious to kind of see what, um, what the like with work with Nancy a little bit on the short term rental kind of data, so we have a really good idea from the data of you know what our our census looks like. Um, at different months of the year and can identify those trends. So I think that's kind of where I am with my thought process right now. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yes.
And I'm going to have to duck out. I'll watch the rest of the video later. Okay. See and I will see, see you guys next week. And um, just let me know. Bye. We're on the side. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. you know when you leave, you get all the work. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. Now, we have, now we have somebody to give it to you. Yeah. Uh, Susan, are you ready to go yet? Or are you? No, actually, I'd rather listen to Nancy. I don't want to like reiterate things six times, and I have one really main point. So I'd rather let Nancy go. Okay. Um, first of all, I also would like to thank the town for putting this committee together. I'd like to thank everybody who participated. Um, we had a lot more participants than I, I expected. Um, I, however, would like to go on record that I do feel this should be a SAPOA issue um, for voting purposes and not a town because the majority of rental people who own rental properties are non-residents. Um, and I do think it affects them. And if we want to talk about cohesiveness of the community, we're pitting residents against non-residents, basically. Um, we heard from um, many of the owners who rent, those who don't rent. Um, I was surprised that it seemed to be between two thirds and three fourths of it were the um, people who rent. And I expected the residents of Seabrook to be out in force um, against rentals and for a cap. My concern is the current town council and the mayor ran on the platform that they they were in support of caps. And I hope that all these hours and the work we have put in are not for show. And just so that they can come back and say, well, we did all this and now we're putting caps in and that's all there is to it. The previous regime or town council or whoever did recommend a cap was 25% of the build out of the island. All right, um, so it was stated that they did offer a cap, but yes, it was 25% of the build out of the island. Um, the platform that people ran on was, that was that was not acceptable. Um, we even had, during all the participants, the presentations, we had um, a person who was very adamantly opposed to caps, probably one of the extreme, even say last year was wonderful. It wasn't crowded. Well, last year is the first year that we have been without COVID. COVID affected rentals in 21 and 22. Rentals are down another 15 to 20% this year. I've spoken with Seabrook Exclusive, Sweetgrass, the various rental companies. I did not speak with Picasso. Um, I just, I couldn't get a hold of them, but I do think we have to be careful that we're not reacting to an anomaly, something that has never happened before and hopefully never will. I understand we have to plan for the future and I think that's fine, but I would hope we're not doing a knee jerk reaction because of COVID. 800 properties in the last year have changed hands, we've been told. Um, are Can I correct you on that one? Yeah. Heather just reminded us today it's 800 properties in the last three years. Okay. She, she what I, I thought, I'm sorry, I thought, okay. 800 properties in the past three years. Our resident base has changed. We now have owners working for home from home. We now have over 150 children living full-time on Seabrook. So... Things have changed. I was appalled to hear um, non-residents talk about when they're here, the treatment they receive from people as everybody else was, I know. But you can't label somebody because they're young and they can afford to be here. Maybe we couldn't afford it at their age, but they can. You can't, you can't penalize them and treat them as a second class citizen. Nobody should be treated as a second class citizen. I don't care if you're the, you know, the president of the country coming here or whatever, but we have renters, we have guests, we have owners, and we have members, and everybody should be treated with the same respect. Everybody loves coming here. Some people are fortunate enough that we can afford to live here. Um, and we hope that doesn't.
doesn't change. Um, Seabrook has always prided itself on being a community. Well, everyone is treating it like non-residents are not part of the community. When we owned our seat in our Seabrook, our first community, the first property we owned here, we got we knew everybody, all the non-residents knew each other. The kids texted each other, when are you coming down? When are you coming down? We even have sea loft reunions now because so many of us have moved on and bought properties and moved here permanently that we get together with reuni reunions. We invite the people who currently own the sea lofts to come to it. So it's fun for people to meet the people who have who own their place now when they owned it. We had four generations of, of people who owned our place, 939 sea loft years ago. So people are serving on boards, people are serving on committees. I don't think it's fair to say non-residents are not part of the community. They are a very integral part of this community. We heard comparisons from towns um, from California to New Jersey and in between. Ted just mentioned that we should be thinking of our neighbor Kiowa. Yeah, Kiowa imposed caps a couple years ago, 20% on zone one, 40% on another zone area and no caps on the villas. They're not anywhere near reaching those caps. The, um, I already said the previous town councils was. Enforcement seems to be a common denominator regardless of your position for caps. Um, I think we need to work with SAPOA and the town and the club, as has been suggested, form a committee, have representatives from our committee and from each entity and work together. Seabrook is entirely different than any community because we have the three different entities. They all have their own administrations. They all have their own rules. Um, there's a lot of rules here on Seabrook, as we all know. Um, but enforcement is very, very important. If, if somebody thinks that a car on pine straw looks trashy or look, looks, you know, like, I don't want to say, it's like trailer park or whatever, whether it's a rental guest parking on that pine straw or an owner parking on that straw, pine straw, it still looks bad. If we're gonna have rules, I think they should be rules for everyone. I don't think it's fair that certain people have these rules and you can't have these, and others, if they're owning, it doesn't matter. I've had enforcement call me, I've, I've had Deb call me, you know, LSVs are parked on the pine straw, and then we look, it's an owner. In Deb's case, it does matter because of the More pipes. Of pipes and stuff. Yeah. In enforcement, it's okay, it's the owner is there, so we can't say anything. Well, that's not right. It, the rules rules are rules, and they're not meant to be broken. Um, before on imposing caps, I think maybe we look at a minimum night stays between Memorial Day and Labor Day. Maybe the um, seven night caps for the houses. I think you have to be careful labeling them as single family homes, as tarpon ponds, summer winds, etc., are still single family homes. Maybe you look at it the properties with regimes versus non-regimes. Because most homeowners properties are not, don't have regimes. Or if they do, they've taken care of the issue, they've had voted, they voted, some have passed, some have not passed. Um, it was recently said that um, the rental companies want the entire island to be rentals because they make more money. No, we don't. <laughs> Nobody wants an entire, we love Seabrook the way it is too, but things change, things change. We're still 25% or less of the rentals, properties rent on this island. Yes, the number has increased, but so has the number of owners and properties increased. It's still stayed at 25%. So we have more owners than ever on this island. More owners have people visiting the island. I don't think there should be any you know, you can't cap the number of friends you can have, but I know we've had way more people at our house than we do in, um, than we allow in rentals. Also, when people are looking at the figures and everything, the, I was told they look at 100% capacity. Well, let me tell you, no house on Seabrook has 100% capacity unless it's a full-time resident living there. 
No rental has 100% capacity. If a rental has 55% capacity on Seabrook, it's considered very, very good. So a lot of them will have snowbirds January, February, and March, but those aren't considered short-term rentals. Um, I do have, um, when we're talking about data, I do have one thing I wanna say. The busiest week um, in 2023, and probably every year is July 4th week, okay? Um, I talked to the amenity card office. Um, there were 449 rental properties occupied that got amenity cards that week, okay? So there, there are about, I would say, three to 4% of rental properties do not belong to the club and so don't get amenity cards, all right? It's a very small percentage, but that was 17 so 17 percent of the island was occupied by rental guests the week of july 4th and that's supported by our data and that that's probably the biggest week besides thanksgiving that owners use their properties but it's the most crowded week and that's the week we hear a lot of complaints about from people that is so crowded and the water guns and, and the squirting of the water and everything that's more owners than rentals doing that and i'll attest to that because my husband's probably the biggest instigator of that. <laughs> the economic impact I think is huge. I think a few things we forget about are um, there have been complaints recently that SIPO enacted a, the $300 increase and people were up in our, a few people were up in arms about that. Well let me tell you if we put a cap on short term rentals that lowers it club fees will go up the club has estimated um, that each property that they they got over thirty percent of their operating cost was from, um, and that's their operating cost, so it doesn't take into account dues. But the rentals brought in anywhere between three million and five million dollars each year. Last year, that it was down. Um, so the club dues, according to the treasurer would have to go up approximately $2,000 per membership a year if we did not, if we lower rentals or if we don't have rentals. For the town, a huge percentage of the town's um, budget is from the short-term rental permits and business licenses, whether it's contractors, whether it's um, rentals, but the majority are rentals. Um, the town received money from the A tax. It's around seven hundred thousand dollars a year. That funds the beach patrol. That funds the fireworks for Fourth of July. It funds dolphin education, turtle patrol, and many other activities that the residents partake in. So, I just think we have to be very, very careful that we don't have unintended, as someone pointed out, unintended consequences when we put a cap on the rentals. Talking about grandfathering. Grandfathering does nothing to solve the problem right away. And, and if people are up in arms about it, grandfathering everybody won't solve anything. As people sell their properties, then it, it will lower the, um, the number of rentals. However, the real estate, especially the villas, the real estate company has said every realtor I've spoken to, and I've spoken to a lot because our office is now over there, um, has said it will kill the market for villas. If we have a cap that someone who's buying a villa cannot rent it, it will kill the market for villas. And the villas, many people, I hope everybody realizes that next your next door neighbor who's a rental could be, is going to be your next door neighbor as a resident and owner here in Seabrook next. Very few people just buy on Seabrook um, without visiting either a friend or family here or renting a property first. Um, in closing, I don't think a cap is warranted um, at this time. I think we need to study it more. Um, there are 1,200 homes on Seabrook and the last I checked, we had eight to nine percent of them were rentals. Um, if we want to treat them separately, I would divide it by villas, people with regimes and um, non-regimes. 
And I thank you for letting us be on this committee to voice our opinion. Thank you. <laughs> I have, <coughs> excuse me, I had one question and then one comment. The question is, <clears throat> the real estate people we've spoken to, when they say we'll kill the market, is that with a cap that is lower than the current number of yes. rentals or any cap whatsoever? The cap. lower, if it's lower. Right, okay, because I do think that's an important clarification mm -hmm. as we go forward. Um, the comment that I'm going to make is simply, I'm not responding to people's things except this one is about me, so I'm going to say that, which is um, in when I ran for town council, I recall having a very specific platform for short-term rentals. Um, others, uh, others did, but um, my uh, I responded in writing to a number of inquiries from uh, the Big One Voters, the Island Connection, uh, and one more. Um, C. Brooker, maybe? No, I don't think it was C. Brooker. That no, wasn't C. Brooker. Could have been. Tide lines, yeah. So if you go back and look at my written responses, um, I don't think, I may be wrong, but I don't think you're going to find any specifics from me about short-term rentals other than the fact, because I'm sure I was asked short-term rental questions, that um, now, post-COVID, post-influx, is a good time to, to deal with the issue when it's not in a crisis mode. I probably, I know I said that um, orally and I probably said that in writing, but um, unless I have a huge memory lapse, which is always possible, um, I, I, I really didn't have anything uh, in my campaign specific about um, caps or specifics about regulating short-term Okay, well, the whole group would make campaign with models, whatever, yeah. Right, well, I mean, just, Mm -hmm. That's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tracy probably wants to. Yeah, no, I am. Okay. Tracy, you're up. Hi, everybody. Coming to you today from sunny California. Um, thank you to everybody for uh, volunteering on this committee. Um, I've certainly learned a lot from all the comments and reading through everything and seeing everybody's presentations. Um, as I had said before, I moved to the island in 2020. And as I do my own research, looking at the history of Seabrook Island, um, you know, you can go back and read all these things. In 85, the residents of the island voted to have a town. Um, and then in, I guess it was 2005, I think it was the Sapoa residents that voted to have the mandatory membership, club membership with purchase. Um, and to me, that kind of promoted, maybe unintentionally, <laughs> a little shift to live here full time, join the club, it's, you know, live here, an active lifestyle, retirement type of thing. Um, the island is special. I think in a way it was very wise of those initial residents to vote to have a town and municipality, which is kind of the top of the umbrella. Um, I kind of look at it as being the parent to set the tone. I mean, this is a sea island. It's very small. The environment is important to everybody. Um, and I think that what I see in my personal opinion is that the rentals and the full-timers coexisted very peacefully because the island wasn't built out, there weren't as many people. And I think there is a change going on with more people living here full time or just owning them as second properties. Um, I'm a little different than a lot of people I think on this committee and maybe a lot of the owners on the island, but I chose Seabrook. It was so different than Kiowa, Isle of Palms, Folly. I mean, the moment we saw Seabrook, it's like, wow, this is a hidden gem. It's so quiet, residential. And I, I think even people who buy the short-term rentals, that's, it's the wow factor. Where has this been? Um, and I made a choice. I would like to dispel one narrative, I guess, 
that I heard a lot in the people who buy rentals that nobody will ever live in a villa or a condo because they're so small. Well, I made the conscious choice. I'm just here as an example of retiring at 55 and selling my four bedroom, three bath colonial house in a different state, retire at 55 to downsize and live in a condo so I could enjoy um, a quieter lifestyle and I didn't have to work if I didn't want to. So I am a full-time resident in a small condo. We do exist um, and live here on the island. And there is a quality of life. I my, my position is I do think that the town is responsible for looking ahead as a steward of the sea island to keep it as it is and implement a cap. I I understand when I bought a villa that yes, there are renters. I'm not saying that I don't think we should ban rentals at all. I think people should be grandfathered. Um, however, it's prudent to have a limit because at any time, all of them could be filled. If you don't have a cap, it could happen. They could all be filled. And that changes the nature of everything on the island, the traffic, the quality of life. Um, so I'm hopeful that we can look at this as an effort also to preserve what everybody loves about the island and coexist nicely. Yes, the rentals bring in money. Um, it seems to be the amount that we have as rentals right now seem to be a good level for financial reasons, I think, for the town, for Sapoa. You know, and I and I also think it would be nice, um, you know, people, Nancy just alluded to, well, our fees are going to go up if we lessen the rentals, I guess. Um, but I think that maybe that would force, in a way, residents to actually scrutinize the budgets more of Sapoa and the club um, to see where cuts could be made. Possibly, they seem to me personally to be a little out of control. Every they're just upping them, upping them, upping them. Um, but we'll see. Um, there is a quality of life issue associated with being a full time resident on here, which I think caps would help with. When you have a rental guest to come in without any limits. It's possible in any rental, and you notice it more probably in the condos and villas because they're closer together, to have turnover three times a week. If you have two nights here and there, and every turnover requires a cleaning crew, a maintenance inspection, sometimes a property inspection. So it's not just one family coming in, one family leaving. It's a lot. And that does affect the quality of life for the people who do live here full time. Um, I do think we need to investigate this data a little bit um, so that we get a base for how are the number of rentals, is it a good amount to keep? Um, are they affecting you know, crime at all? I notice like when I go on this, I don't think we know. I, I We go on the Sapoa website and the safety committee minutes I, I look at, well, there's no reports for July and August last year which are the busiest times of year. Um, I know that, I know myself, Nancy's been very responsive, you know, if there's a problem with a renter and taking care of the things with the two hour window, which I think is great. Um, but she's not required to keep track of all the people that are making complaints, nuisance complaints. Um, the town just started their porter last year People don't know who to call, so I don't think we have an accurate number on the effect of quality of life, whether it's theft or nuisance or whatever, on what's really going on at the town. Um, and I think even rental people, you know, they all say a common theme I heard was my renters are never a problem. Well, I believe they believe that, but I also think sometimes they're not being told that they don't they just don't know that there is a disruption sometimes um, that affects the full timers. 
So I think that's something I'd, I'd like to dive into to see where do we really stand on how rentals are affecting the full-time residents on the island, just in that little vein. Um, what else can I say? I mean, I, I think that's it. I think we need to implement some sort of cap. I think people should be grandfathered in. Um, I question, I mean, everybody has their own thoughts about this. The, you know, if we have caps, these va the property values are going to go down. Well, how are the properties being marketed? I mean, if they're being marketed as, oh, come to Seabrook Island, you could make money by having a short-term rental versus come to Seabrook Island. It's private, gated. We have a hospital now coming right down the road. You know, I, I think if you marketed it differently, the prices would really go up is my opinion because location 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 is always the first i've heard in real estate um i may have a little condo in bay point but i'll tell you what i have a million dollar view that you can't find a lot of places um and there is an interesting thing i'm finding in my little community we now have about 40 percent of the properties as short-term rentals and i can tell you just from what I'm seeing, when you have an area that has 40 to 50%, it's probably it's probably in that range right now, of absent owners, it's hard to get anybody on the board. The board's all absent owners. The maintenance is declining because they're not there on site to see it. And if you put in a request, they're not quickly going to take care of it because it doesn't bother them because they're not there. And I, I think we need to be really careful on not looking into having limits in the regimes for how many, uh, having unlimited caps on regimes doesn't make sense to me because you really don't want one area of the island that has 80% rentals or whatever. Um, because then during hard economic times, people will lower their prices. And I think what Star had said, I think we do need to look into minimum nights, minimum prices for rentals. I don't think it's helpful for the island at all to have you know the rentals going for $50 a night just because the economy is terrible and nobody's renting and people are getting desperate. And they've bought these properties with the expectation that they were gonna be self-supporting. Um, which I don't think it is a wise thing to buy a property if you can't afford it on your own anyway. I just don't think that's wise personally, but there are unintended consequences to not having these limits. And I, I think it's time now that the island is being built out to really try and find a peaceful coexistence, financially, quality of life in all the areas on the island so that we can work this out. So it's more even is all I'm going to say. So thank you for giving me the chance to have a voice and to dig into some of the data and, and see what we can come up with. Thank you, Tracy. Appreciate it. I'll, hopefully you'll be back in Seabrook soon. Yep. And safe. Thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. okay. I, said, I know. I said, the the last last I said my dinner tonight's going to be really late. I told my husband I'd be out of here at noon. That was wishful thinking, huh? It, um, I just want to make a couple points. I, and one of the reasons I wanted to go last is I had a feeling I, a lot of what I had written down, I've got three pages here, was already going to be said. So I didn't want to keep keep you know saying the same thing over. But one thing, um, I am part-time. We've been owners for nine years. And as the years have gone on, we're here more and more. And for a lot of different reasons. And I think... Uh, there's been so many things and I can't even read next door anymore because it just makes me ill. But one of the things, big point is I really reject not being called part of the community because I'm part time here. I know my neighbors. I, you know, in fact, I drove down there last night down to Pelican Watch just to try to run into one person because I know she walks her dog at that hour. Just because I wanted to say something to her because I know a situation that's going on with her. But I made, a, you know, I, she's actually a part time renter now, but she's a snowbird and has been a snowbird probably about 12 years that she's been coming here. 
But we know her. We know her dog. We know, you know, other people. So I go, you know, out to the spit and talk to people about dolphin watching or, you know, being a good citizen on that. We do it going up the river because we see so many people doing things they shouldn't be, the dolphins. So I really hate the fact that just because we're here part time, it's considered we're not part of the community or invested in the community. I, I don't think that's true. And knowing a lot of my neighbors that are here part time, I think they would agree with that. My second thing, and especially Daryl, we were having this conversation when I know you had to go the other day. I get it when everybody's saying, what if? What if there's another pandemic? What if something happens? But to, to the point of, yes, we got found. I don't know how you find this island again. And you know things changed. We saw a lot of turnover just in my little world, Spinnakers and Pelican Watch. But a lot of the turnover that happened is those, like even when we bought, our, the numbers were really depressed to buy. Well, you know, you couldn't sell a pelican, like who well, granted we bought it, but ours was on the market for over a year. That's how long they stayed on. Now, all of a sudden you have people coming in. One of the units that actually we were looking at to buy as a second unit, it went in six hours. You know, it turned around literally, I met the real estate agent in the parking lot. By the time she came down with it, she did a virtual tour. By the time she came down with it, they had a, a contract done. That's not happening anymore either. Now, if you look at the villas, how the, the length of time on the market is very. So we're kind of back in that. It's very circular as far as they go up in price, they come down in price, you can sell it or you can't sell it. But I think, you know, looking at this, if there's another pandemic, you know, people are people who have bought and lived here full time, how are they going to turn into renters? The notion that all of a sudden rents are going to spike, where first, where are these people going to go? Like, oh, I'd like to rent my house out, but they got to go somewhere if they're going to rent their house out. I don't see how the numbers are going to spike if there's another situation that drives people down to the beach. I, I just don't get that argument. Like, the renters are the, you know, the rental units are the rental units. It's not going to change overnight. And, and it didn't change overnight with COVID or post-COVID. I mean, it took a gradual time for things to sell and then new owners coming in and you know what i think is great a lot of the new owners coming in are young and you know to nancy's point the children on the island which i think is absolutely fantastic that we're bringing you know a younger group into it so i just it gets me very frustrated when i hear some of these comments and you know one of the biggest reasons you know i've been following this i've been following it for a couple of years and I, I really, you know, I wanted to be on this panel about, you know, when Bruce got, you know, first came in, or I should say mayor, first came in, you know, I met with him and I met with you, Daryl, that day, you know, I came up here, I spent my time sitting here. I really, really feel strongly about the villas. And it might not be every single villa in, on the island, and, you know, you talk about having an electronic map, I'm um, looking at all the, my husband did that, he wrote a code, and before I left the house yesterday, he showed it to me. It needs some tweaking, but it, it quite honestly, it doesn't tell you a lot. You know, we actually looked at Baywood and where the houses actually were. You look at the condos, and yeah, you know, you look at Pelican Watch, there's a lot of condos, but quite frankly, it's only at 60%. When you look at how many rent and how many, how many people that own that don't even come. There's one unit I know, I've seen people there once and it was during COVID. They're, you know, it's an LLC out of Miami. They're never there, they don't use it. But, you know, so yeah, they are absentee owners and they don't rent, but the level of, the, you know, even though we're only at 60%, it's probably a lot higher than it was before because a lot of those villas turned over when they could, when they sold and they cashed out because they could. And I just don't see that happening again because where we are, it raised the level to a point where you're only going to pay so much for a 900 square foot villa, even though we're sitting on the beach. You know, especially in a lot of the things that I think have controlled the sale of them is our insurance just went up drastically and the club membership. You know, most people don't want to live in 900 square feet. Now, not to say we don't have owners at Pelican Watch and, you know, there's owners at Spinnaker and Atrium. It's not overwhelming that most of them are renters and the people come in. And it's not that they rent because they can't afford to own the place and just own it outright. It does, you know, they're not using it and they're offsetting the cost for it. And I think if we 
we try to look at the numbers of where the villas went up percentage-wise versus the houses. We really need to be careful in thinking, one, do they need a cap? And two, what is that cap and how does it relate to the homes? That I don't think you can just lump it all in because they're a very different entity. And if you, you know, we ever even thought about putting a cap on it, you'd never sell them. You know, if we limited the ability to sell and have someone buy and they could rent. And um, you would totally kill the market. And I mean, I have a whole bunch of other things to say, but I think a lot of the points have been made a lot of times. And I, I'm, I'll be very honest, Daryl, I'm a little disappointed when, you know, I've been working on this, obviously, I drive back and forth because my villa is rented. And to hear you say, you know, proposing a cap, but what is the number? You know, to me, it's not an open mind that there should be, you know, why do we need a cap? Why do we need a cap? Because other places are doing it. I don't think that justifies why we should even look at it or look at it to the point where we need to make a decision before June or at June council meeting. That, you know, I, I think things have been so changing. You know, the world did change with COVID and then it changed post COVID. And now we're even more past that. And, you know, everyone knows the numbers are down. Home sales are, you know, well, we've got the real estate agent right there. Home sales, you know, seem to be leveled off. I know the villas are down drastically in selling. You know, and that's, you know, people look at the overall cost of owning and it's not, you know, it's very prohibited to a lot of people. We should probably be thankful we had people coming in and buying, you know, investing that type of money. That's it, but I just hope my hours of driving back and forth and being here aren't for something that the mind is already made up on. That we are, you know, we do have a committee here that's open minded. Right. Uh, okay, a couple points, Susan. Um, one on the last point of an open mind, um, at some point we have to start forming opinions. As I said, we can evolve, I could change, but I think I owed it to the community to um, tell them where I'm starting from. Uh, if I don't uh, tell you where I'm st starting from, then you can't tell me where I'm wrong, right? So it's it's part of an iterative process of, of trying to uh, learn, so I, haven't made a final decision, but um, uh, I do think um, it's important for us to know sort of where we're at so we can have these conversations. And if there's some sort of uh, data or arguments that uh, persuade otherwise, I'm always open to that. Although I think it was all you said, I'm not sure the data is, is actually ultimately going to um, I don't know that there's one set of data that then gives us an answer. Like right. artificial intelligence, we the data will put in a certain amount of data, and the AI will spit spit out a paragraph. Yeah. The that's data will inform, but it's not going to say we're not going to have an aha moment, and we say, oh, there's the answer. Right. I just don't believe it's right. going to be that black and white. Right. It'll help them. Right. So it does. Now the second uh, point, though, Susan, is I do want. Um, to clarify or even perhaps apologize to the extent that uh, that I was saying or could be interpreted as saying that no nobody who who owns a second home here but who doesn't live here is part of the community. Many, many people. Oh, well, I wasn't uh, part of you. I mean it's been a whole lot well, no, of I, but I do want to say that um, I do think that on average in the aggregate it's just a lot easier to be part of the committees, part of the uh, of the of the groups, et cetera. If if you live here, and if everybody was in again a hypothetical world, if everybody here were second homeowners, um, getting here when they could, driving from Atlanta, et cetera, then it's it's I think it would be really difficult to to keep uh, going a lot of the things that we have going what makes Seabrook special. That does, and by the way, I, I mean, I, I think you drive back and forth from Atlanta. It's gotta be more than just about anybody else. Most people aren't willing to be here that much to be on the committees. I appreciate all, all, that, all that you do. Um, it's, um, 
it's it's a lot of driving that you do not to not to be here um just because it's a holiday weekend or a summer weekend and you want to enjoy the place but you'll you'll drive back and forth to, to be in a committee meeting or you'll be back and forth uh to attend a town council meeting and um, and that's great but that's difficult and um it and so overall i i do think that to keep a lot of this going from a sheer logistical standpoint, it, it requires a lot of um, uh, full-time members of the community. But I don't mean in any way to say that um, uh, people who aren't here but don't live here are not part of the community. So I do want to make that clear. Okay, um, unless anybody else has any more comments, and I assume we're all exhausted by now that you don't, uh, the final thing I want to do is just plan out what, what you're going to be doing. Um, I have some sort of a, assignments that I've spoken uh, to people about. They're not, it's not a comprehensive thing. They'll, they'll evolve and we'll, um, uh, people can help each other out. As, as I was saying to Ted before the meeting started, the best thing could be uh, for everybody to sort of get together and, and, and sort of work it out like what you want to look at, what I want to look at, et cetera. But that that can't happen um, because in a different environment, you, you can have an email exchanges and say, you do this. Well, I'm, I, I wanted to look at that. Let's do it together. And we can't do that. That, that uh, at least uh, as our current understanding of the Freedom of Information Act, South Carolina, is uh, if we are precluded from doing that. So it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit uh, more difficult to engage in the data analysis. I'll get to that in a second, but at first I want to say, Joe, Catherine, um, what would be helpful for next week is if we could have whoever you thought was appropriate, uh, yeah. Tyler, um, Beth, to uh, be available, not, not be available, but to sit here and answer the questions of the committee in terms of how enforcement does work, what resources we have, who reports what to whom. Uh, I, I have questions, you know, some of the things seem fairly um, simple, but that may not be. So for example, if somebody, <clears throat> if we were to have a publicly available database of everybody's um, local contact so that um, Deb knew, by the way, I'm gonna divert for a second and say what Ollie told me on our phone call was that Apparently, there's like a poster you have to post on who the point of local contact is, which is inside the unit. Okay. So that's great for that person, I guess, if the toilet doesn't work at 1 a.m. in the morning. Not so great for the neighbor who's got a problem with the noise, whatever, at 1 o'clock in the morning. They would have to go over, knock on the door, and say, Can I walk in and see your, who your point of local contact is? So that that doesn't work. Um, but what if there were a system where uh, everybody could have access to that, but then there, the local contact had an obligation, legal obligation to report that. You don't have to answer the question now. I'm just saying those are the sort of questions that I think would be helpful to have a panel from the town, whoever is appropriate, uh, Tyler and Beth, certainly, whoever else, you, um, so that we could, uh, in, in, over the next week, ourselves think of questions that we had. What, what do we need to do to, to enforce these things? Now, the other um, part of that, frankly, and that's, uh, I'll get to in a second, with our SAPOA uh, liaisons, is it would be helpful to have somebody from SAPOA also appear so that we could actually have a the more global picture of what is so supposed to do. But um, uh, 
but obviously I'm not going to be so presumptuous to say that Sapoa would have that representative available for our for our next meeting. Um, but that's one thing I think that. So Joe, does that sound something we can do here? Yeah, we can be here. Okay. So um, that so that's what I think we should focus on at the next meeting is the enforcement aspects of this, and everybody should give thought over the next week what sorts of things they would like to be enforced. And I know Molly is looking at that. Daryl, would you also like to have a club representative too at the meetings? Um, I don't. I mean, I'm happy to have a club. I'm just, I'm just not sure the, what enforcement they do. So uh, this is more like what are the what are the rules that are I mean the, the capacity issue is something we certainly need to confer with the club on and everything. But in terms of what are the nuisance type things that people uh, uh, are complaining about, there seem to be somewhat universal agreement that to the extent there are, we can focus on enforcement. Um, I just don't think a club is, does that kind of enforcement. Um, so um, in terms of assignments, uh, we've talked, we've spoken about, um, I mean, Susan, you or have volunteered to work on compiling some of this data and, and putting it in sort of useful forms. Um, Ali has spoken about like, what do we need? Um, but when we do it, for example, if we had graphs of short-term rentals over time, that's broken down um, between the different zoning districts or whatever. Because I don't know from the town perspective whether we yeah. do, deal with regimes versus um, we, from a support perspective, there, 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 there are regimes. Um, from the town perspective, I think it's more different zoning districts that we're we, we do track both, and I, I will say we have. Excellent data back to 2019. So we have five excellent years of data. Before 2019, um, management companies could pull, we didn't have a short term rental permit at the time, so all we had was a business license. Management companies could apply and obtain one license for all the properties that they manage. So we don't know if the company comes in if they're managing two properties. Or 200 properties we would only have one license um so if you get beyond you know earlier than 2019 i can't tell okay. you how reliable that data is going to be at least the data that we have but everything in the last five years i mean we have it by dwelling type zoning district we have all the regime uh, numbers and you can even look at it how it's changed over each of the years over the five years okay so Susan, if you work with Joe on that, I think yeah. to, to put that in a form that's uh Yeah, and I can make to... any graphs or anything. That's right. that's fine. I mean, I don't know if you guys have a template from like a PowerPoint template, something that I can make it very uniform. I mean, I hate to like recreate something if you've already got it. I mean, a lot of it's more conducive, especially when you're getting into like regimes and those type of things, it's conducive to tables. Yeah, that's right. Kind of graphs, yeah, kind of graphs, graphs 40, tables, whatever. 40 different regimes is not going to make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> but, um, yeah, certain things we do graphs, certain mm -hmm. things we do. Yeah, so you two work together. That I don't obviously want to micromanage that, that mm -hmm. process. Um, Ted, uh, we, we talked about um, the chart of what other communities have done. We we have two things as starting points. One is uh, the Municipal Association. The second is what Susan McLaughlin submitted. Um, I, I think those 
should be the starting point in, in terms of just confirming. I mean, they're fairly effective data that requires going to the uh, to the municipalities um, and uh, websites and, and basically just confirming that what's in there is correct without um, any uh, it's a sort of a trust but verified thing. For all I know, every single word in those is up to date and correct, but we just want to confirm it. And if we could have, if there's anything in one that's not in the other, if they could be, be combined, um, I don't know what your word processing capabilities are, but to the extent we could consult one thing that would be our sort of Bible on what other communities have done, I think that that would be great. Um, one of the things that I, I think uh, Star has talked about, and she can take the bull by the horns on, is the looking at the regimes that have uh, restricted short-term rentals on Seabrook and seeing what the history is with sales and and real estate values. Um, she's also talked about mapping. I think, Susan, you said that you had already done that. Or well, husband, I got to give credit to my husband. Had, your husband had, had already done that but needed some refinements. I think that would be helpful. We have seen him send that to our GIS contractor. We're probably taking oh, uh, really? five minutes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Tracy and Ali, one of the things that uh, we spoke about was what are the list of nuisance slash conduct, however you want to call it, regulations that we need? Um, We can, we'll talk about enforcement, but what is it that, that would be recommended um, for us to consider as those sorts of regulations? Um, and then also, Ali, as you pointed out, you volunteered to just think about what kind of data would be helpful in informing a decision on caps, not uh, as you as you correctly point out, being able to come up with a magic answer, but at least uh, inform the process. Yeah, and one thing Joe just said that I want, so I don't lose this thought is we need to be careful on worrying about getting too much history. I mean, it's nice to say it's been like this for thirty five years, but. 35 years ago versus what we're facing today, to me, for most things, if you look at a five, six, seven year window, that's probably God's plenty enough data. So just be, if you need to go back further to prove a point, that's fine. But I would, you're going to bury yourself in data. If everything we're trying to do, we, we want back since the island was formed in the 70s. I think 2019 is a good place to start because mm -hmm. it's pre-COVID. Right. COVID. Then we have COVID. Then we have post-COVID. So right. I agree with you. Like that five minute, five year window. You'll get your arm to run that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The other, the other thing, and I, I apologize if I jump in here, but no you know, the town has a database of complaints, and I used it once, but it's not like I never loaded every challenge I ever had, and that's why I made a comment that I'd rather have a central database that everything's there. I'd be curious what's there now. Like, you've had it for what, about a year? I'd be. July, well, July will be a year. Okay. But be curious to understand just a summary, like a highlight of what, what kind of things were submitted into the database. Yeah, I was actually going to ask if I could see it because looking at real complaints may help formulate where you need to worry about what, what's out there, what's happening, what do we have to worry about, where do we need enforcement? So that, you know, observed violations get in there two different ways. One are from the public, if they see something yeah. they report it um, to us and it gets logged and assigned to code enforcement officer. Um, our code enforcement officers also use it if they come across something in the field. 
So if you were to go back and look at the data, you'll find 90% of it or more is probably going to be business license violations because that's the, I mean, there is no the big, business yeah. license. Yeah, it's a different way far and away is the number one violation that we have on the island. Um, but we can, we can go in and um, we have about nine going on 10 months of good data. Um, now, what it may not tell you is that they observe, if code enforcement observes a violation at a property that's a rental, but it's not a violation of the rental ordinance, it's not going to break that out as it's a rental violation. It's just going to be, you know, somebody leaves trash out at the street, that's not governed in our rental ordinance, so it would be listed as a trash violation. Maybe a rental, may not be. Um, but for violations of the rental ordinance, all those would be locked in there as well. Rental rental. And since we want to uh, we want to look at nuisances on why it's not just rentals, but just buy on wide nuisances, I thought that might give us a clue. Yeah. You know, of what would you've seen. I mean, I've had 10 plus years of nuisance adventures in my neighborhood that I can summarize, but I'm curious. Well, I, you know, I, would, I would qualify that. And this was, I think, one of the key recommendations that came out of the last committee is we don't have a nuisance ordinance. Oh, I know so that. When you go to our website, if you're going to complain about noise, I mean, that's probably one of the top complaints we hear about and you all have heard about as part of this process. You go to our, our portal to report a noise complaint, you're going to, you're going to land on a landing page. And it's going to tell you, here's the things our ordinance covers. So if it's one of these things, go through this portal and we'll accept your complaint. But if it's noise, we don't have a noise ordinance. You can call POA if it's behind the gate. You can call sheriff's office if it's outside the gate. So you're not going to get the whole universe of all of yeah, the types of complaints. I because just it's not something that, that we regulate through our ordinance right we're not going to have the, 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 the noise and noise ordinance is something that we could suggest right huh? yeah i mean i have yeah. sat down to be honest with you i always yeah. thought we had yeah. yeah uh joe but is there any problem with ollie and deb looking at the database uh, I can't give them access to identifying information. Um, we can pull out some aggregate numbers and those type things, but not raw data. And that's fine. I just thought to share it with the whole committee just to get an idea. Like you said, well, the bulk of it's going to be business licenses, but you know what else is there? Just to give us an idea. And then, you know, sadly, I only loaded one code enforcement deal where I had an owner that was redoing his cottage and he had all his construction trash out in front of his cottage for over a week. And I, I think I loaded that one complaint and then the code enforcement officer came and helped me. But um, I'm just curious, just the pattern. And I you know, made the suggestion it would be nice to expand this database and we could load more information now from Sapoa and from the rental companies. So we had one place to go and I could, and I know Nancy could do this too. I could tell you the one place in my neighborhood that had the biggest problem and it was an Airbnb. So I could tell you, this is the problem child that we need to focus on from an enforcement standpoint. So it's kind of what I was getting at. You know, instead of people um, embellishing on problems we have in the island, we have problems, but if we identify what some of them are and we have enforcement that can control it, it would make a more peaceful community and experience for everybody. Right, and, and a way of reporting that's easy for people to use. And um, as I said, I think we'll get into it next week. So no reason to pro prolong this meeting now, but even in terms of the, the uh, local contact who gets a complaint, um, I would suggest looking into whether that person should have an obligation to then forward that complaint to the town to be on a database. I mean, to some extent, numbers are, are not, if, if, if people don't think things are being enforced, they don't report them. I mean, you see that in crime statistics where it, it's like, you know, it looks like in certain cities, shoplifting is maybe down 
because it turns out that everybody knows nothing's going to happen. So why why would you ever report it if if nothing's ever going to happen? It doesn't mean that it's down. It means nobody's reporting it, and um, obviously that's something to consider um, here to, to to come up with a system that that encourages reporting and has enforcement that encourages that cycle. Uh, okay, so um, the then we, we're going to have um, liaisons to work with different entities uh, on the club. That'll be Deb. Um, and when I say liaison, I don't just mean gathering data, but uh, trying to establish relationship to uh, find out what the club's views are. Uh, views is if they if the club uh, takes any official position um, that they want to transmit to us, then by all means they should be encouraged to do so. Um, and also let the club know what what we're doing. Um, with SAPOA, um, the co-liaisons, uh, Nancy and Tracy, um, it, and it's, it's the same thing, getting whatever information uh, we want from SAPOA. I mean, just with the gate pass along, like, I don't know what data should be gathered, but but um, to try to delve into those numbers so that we can get something where we have at least have an apples to apples comparison. But that's just one little small example. The point being um, uh, to get data from Sapoa, but more important um, to work with uh, whoever is working on short-term rentals at Sapoa, there, there was a subcommittee of the legal committee that I think that work has now been moved over to a different committee. Um, but obviously to have Sapoa working on uh, short-term rentals, um, if, 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 if they are, and us working on it and then not coordinating that is, um, not productive, and as many many members of the community pointed out, we should try to work together. Um, it doesn't mean that at the end we'll be able to do some sort of joint action plan together, but we, because uh, things just work sort of differently uh, mm -hmm. among among the entities. But we certainly should let them know what we're doing. Find out what they're doing, find out what their views are, and communicate that views to us along with gathering it. Is there, is there any value, I used to do this when I used to work, having Bruce reach out to Sapola and say, look, we really would like you guys to play along, because my sense is from conversations I've had with you and maybe a few others, is that they kind of beat to their own drum and mm -hmm. You know, Nancy may run into roadblocks because they're beating their own drum. But maybe if somebody above the raw committee level, i.e., the mayor, or you, can yeah, well, reach I, out to them and encourage them. Say, look, we're trying to. This is what we heard. It'd be great if we could get some of this knocked out together, as opposed to not. You know, is there any can, is there any way to push them? Again, you know, I'm relatively only a three or four year full time resident, so maybe that's not possible. But I'm frustrated by the fact that we say that they beat to their own drum, so there's nothing we can do about it. I think if Tracy and I get together and write a letter, but I think not only address it to the administration there, but also the board of directors, right? So then they're all aware of what we're doing and. I think that'll help. What do you think, Tracy? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Yeah, Nolly, um, I, I do want to clarify that I don't 
uh, in any way you want to suggest that Sapo and the club are, are unhelpful? I mean, the, the no, club they, and the town and Sapo do work together, and there are okay. and there are in in long range planning, somebody from one group sits in on other meetings, and so it's it's not that there's nothing going on on Seabrook where there's any degree of cooperation. There there is, and, and they do, and the entities do try to work together, and I'm sure Joe will back me up on that, et cetera. But um, there are different timelines, and for example, and we, we have a timeline set by a, a resolution of town council to have this wrapped up in June. Um, I just think I know enough about Sapoa to know that that's really probably not the not the timeline they're going on in terms of what what they're working on. So well, even to the extent the few people I know at Sapo would leave me with the impression that we're working on something that we don't need to be working on. So again, okay. may, those may not be the important people at Sapo, but they're at Sapo. So I don't know how how that if that feeling is throughout the whole organization or not. So so I so I think that um, what we should do is is have Tracy and Nancy start this process and um i'm pretty confident that they'll make good connections and stuff but yes if they need it but if there are roadblocks and 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 I used to call it delegating up sounds good i mentioned before that i came from the long range planning committee meeting john lasseter is a new chair and he made a comment of working closer with the club in the town so, I mean, I don't know who you want to reach out I to. I think they Dave are Brown. all be close to okay, good. Yeah, Dave Brown or John Lasseter, but instead of going right to an admin, I, I'd start with Dave Brown or John Lasseter and then have them delegate to who can pull data. Yeah, so I think that's the plan. And if there okay. are roadblocks, we'll deal we'll with roadblocks. But, I'm, but, but again, I'm repeating myself, but I wanted to dispel any notion that I'm saying that there's a, 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 a disrespect or a friction among mm -hmm. the things that they all absolutely do try to work together. But at, at the end of the day, there, there are different timelines, there's different interests, there's different that in terms of actually doing some cohesive plan together in by June is, have institutionally difficult, but um, but that does not mean that we can't work together through this process. Would would you see any benefit of inviting? And I'm not talking like the smaller groups and the data gathering things. I mean, the, those can be done, you know, separately. But the key organizations like the PLA and the club. Just inviting their leadership and some of the key people in to sit down and talk with you as a committee. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's one of the things that should be offered both to the club and to Sapoa. That if if their leadership wants to come in as speak at as leadership as people who have been uh, authorized formally and formally, whatever the process is. To give us their views on what we should be thinking about, or if they want to tell us their views of what we should be doing, um, they should be invited to do that. Whether they want to or not, we'll see. But they should, if they if they want to come in and, and speak to us, I'd be <coughs> thrilled to hear. It. And then finally, the, the final assignment liaison is um, Deb for you and uh, co work. I, I think you're already sort of off the galloping start on that. So we'll continue. Um, one other uh, final point is that there's one other factual issue that had, was raised by certain commenters that I don't have the backup on and I want to find out. And, and I can see if I can find out about this. Um, and that is whether there are um, 
rules, regulations that may be new or maybe not new, I don't know. From Fannie and Freddie um, about uh, mortgage issuance where um, certain ratios are exceeded within an HOA of short-term rentals, whether it puts it into a different category um, and that can have its own consequences. Um, also for insurance purposes, does, are there uh, insurance concerns that if uh, certain percentages are exceeded, it becomes a commercial type thing. Um, there were comments made and unless anybody else volunteers to do that, I will uh, just follow up. It's, it was a point that I think needs to be looked into whether what whether there's anything uh, to that or whether um, there there is, but the particulars then obviously need to be uh, documented. I just think it's what was your vast banking experience? It would be perfect for you. Well, thank you, Ted. I appreciate the assignment. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Any one? I yes, just, I just one clarification thing that I wanted to point out, and I forgot to. Um, Someone made the comment about, you know, I think Stardage, do we have a plan that we can shut down and, and or anything? And somebody said, well, if there's already leases in place and can we not shut down? We did shut down during COVID and there were leases and they were just all canceled. And it didn't matter if they had their permits or anything, they were canceled. They were people were scheduled to come in the next day, they were called and they were canceled. So it is possible to do something like that. I think we have had hiring evacuations. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's actually this was something that we found when we were working on the updates last year. There's nothing in our current ordinance that requires rental occupants to evacuate during a mandatory evacuation. Really? So that was something we actually put in the draft and whatever comes out of this committee, that definitely needs to be. Okay, because we do tell them as they have they don't have a choice. It's a state law when there's a mandatory evacuation. And one other thing I would like to add as everybody has their assignments and stuff kind of as a friendly reminder for Freedom of Information Act purposes. All of your notes, all of your emails, all phone calls, text messages um, that you do as committee members and kind of reaching out and kind of stating and asking those questions, they are subject to the public to look at. We There was one still pending, technically. Um, they haven't accepted the cost yet for it, but they have already asked about certain things that this committee has been doing. Um, for email exchanges and text messages and stuff like that. So I just want to make sure that as you do go out, if you want to include either myself or Joe on any of those communications, that way they're on our server. Um, that way I don't have to get into your personal email accounts. Otherwise, I have to sit there with you in my office and we have to log into your emails and I have to go through your personal email. What about any documents you want them to send to you so you can put them on? Yes, please. Just a friendly reminder. <laughs> no, well, first of all, Catherine, thank you. That's an important reminder. Um, sort of on a different thing, to the extent that we come up with data, et cetera, that's all going to be in the public court. So that's not, I mean, all, all that will be loaded for public to see when, when all that's prepared. But Catherine's talking about emails, things like that. Um, and that's a very important reminder, Catherine. Thank you. Um, one, one thing that I did notice on my note that uh, I, I don't know if week by week is important, but when we talk about occupancy levels, if we can look at it also from a seasonal or period, like, like what is the high season? I mean, what, I think that would be a helpful thing to know. Um, and then uh, my final point, just in response to Nancy's, is uh, that is absolutely uh, true that that public health emergency uh, existing leases were canceled. Um, I could see potentially other types of things that were not public health, um, where you had an influx and then there'd be no justification for canceling. 
leases and that, that obviously the justification for canceling leases in a pandemic was the pandemic. Right. The public health aspect of it. Um, okay, any other comments? Any other questions? Okay, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Seven, please. And second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.